khóa học như sau. This session is run at a room meeting, so we will start off our session with basic housekeeping to make you feel comfortable with the platform and say what is installed during our session. Toàn bộ nội dung của buổi học sẽ được ghi âm, à, tệp ghi âm và bài trình bày sẽ được cung cấp tới các anh chị học viên sau khóa học. First, please note that the session will be recorded. The recording and the presentation will be available afterward. Ban tổ chức xin phép sẽ tắt mic và video của các anh chị học viên để chất lượng đường truyền tốt hơn cho khóa học. We have muted everyone by default so the session won't be accidentally disrupted. But when you want to talk later during the discussion, just click the microphone icon on the bottom bar to mute and unmute yourself. If you encounter any challenge on that, please send a message to our host. Nếu anh chị có câu hỏi hay là ý kiến muốn đóng góp cho buổi học thì mong anh chị sẽ chuyển thông tin lên phần chat box của buổi học ạ. Hoặc anh chị có thể thông báo tới ban tổ chức để được bật mic và đặt câu hỏi trực tiếp cho các diễn giả. Uh, there is no interpreter in the sessions. The main point will be provided in Vietnamese or English after each presentation. Buổi học thì sẽ không có phiên dịch trực tiếp. Các nội dung quan trọng sẽ được cung cấp sau mỗi bài trình bày bằng tiếng Việt hoặc bằng tiếng Anh ạ. Sau đây thì tôi xin phép được uh, thông báo buổi học chính thức được bắt đầu. I would like to start the session today with the topic on planning on EV infrastructures, charging infrastructures. Trong buổi học ngày hôm nay thì chúng ta sẽ được uh, nghe các diễn giả tới từ nhiều quốc gia khác nhau trình bày về các nội dung như hiện trạng, thách thức, vai trò của chính phủ trong việc tạo điều kiện và quản lý thiết lập mạng lưới chạm sạc xe điện cũng như là các tiêu chuẩn kỹ thuật về chạm sạc và hướng dẫn quy hoạch mạng lưới quản lý lưới điện. Chúng ta cũng sẽ được nghe về các cái yếu tố tạo nên môi trường thuận lợi cho tất cả các bên liên quan và phát triển các mô hình chạm hợp tác liên quan đến chạm sạc. Cuối cùng chúng ta sẽ được xem các ví dụ điển hình những bài học kinh nghiệm tốt đối với các nước châu Á và các nước phát triển đến từ các đại diện từ Tây Ban Nha, Trung Quốc và Hàn Quốc. Ở phần cuối cùng chúng ta sẽ có nội dung thảo luận Lúc đó thì chúng ta có thể đặt rất là nhiều câu hỏi cho các diễn giả. To start our session today, I would like to introduce Mr. Phan Hoàng Phương. À, trước hết xin được giới thiệu ở diễn giả là ông Phan Hoàng Phương, hiện đang là Phó trưởng phòng giao thông đô thị và nông thôn, Viện Chiến lược và Phát triển Giao thông Vận tải. Ông Phan Hoàng Phương thì đã có rất nhiều năm kinh nghiệm nghiên cứu, xây dựng chính sách, quy hoạch phát triển giao thông vận tải tại Việt Nam. Bên cạnh đó thì ông Phan Hoàng Phương đã chủ trì, tham gia và đóng góp cho các hoạt động phát triển tiêu chuẩn kỹ thuật trong ngành giao thông vận tải, phát triển các giải pháp tiết kiệm năng lượng, các sáng kiến thích ứng với biến đổi khí hậu và áp dụng thí điểm các giải pháp sáng kiến này cho một số vùng khác nhau ở Việt Nam và hỗ trợ cho NDC của ngành giao thông. Trong buổi học ngày hôm nay thì ông Phan Hoàng Phương sẽ trình bày nội dung về hiện trạng, thách thức vai trò của chính phủ trong việc tạo điều kiện và quản lý việc thiết lập mạng lưới chạm sạc xe điện trong tuần học ạ. À uh, to start the session today, Mr. Phan Hoài Phương I will deliver the presentation on current status, challenges, and the roles of government in facilitating and managing charging station network establishment. Please welcome. Xin mời uh, ông Phan Hoàng Phương ạ. Xin chào em. Uh, xin chào tất cả mọi người tham dự uh, buổi học ngày hôm nay. Thì uh, sau đây xin tôi xin phép được trình bày cái bài về những khó khăn hiện nay và vai trò của chính phủ trong việc tạo điều kiện và hỗ trợ cho việc thiết lập mạng lưới chạm sạc điện.
Thì về nội dung bài tham luận của tôi bao gồm 4 phần. Phần thứ nhất là thực trạng hệ thống chạm sạc điện trên toàn quốc. Và phần thứ hai là các thách thức hiện nay trong việc triển khai thiết lập mạng lưới chạm sạc điện. Và phần thứ ba là kinh nghiệm thế giới trong triển khai mạng lưới chạm sạc và các cấp độ sạc phù hợp với hình, mô hình của Việt Nam mà từ đó cũng đưa ra được các cái khuyến nghị về vai trò của chính phủ trong việc tạo điều kiện và hỗ trợ cho việc thiết lập mạng lưới chạm sạc điện. Thế về đánh giá thực trạng của hệ thống chạm sạc điện trên toàn quốc thì như các bài thuyết trình trong những buổi gần đây thì chúng ta đã biết thì theo cục đăng kiểm Việt Nam hiện nay cả nước có khoảng 1,8 triệu xe điện đã đăng ký và trong đó chủ yếu là xe máy điện và xe đạp điện là chiếm khoảng 1,4 triệu còn lại khoảng 1.500 phương tiện ô tô thì do đó hiện nay nhu cầu về sạc điện chủ yếu vẫn là phương tiện về xe máy điện và xe đạp điện và phần lớn cái nhu cầu này thì đều được đáp ứng tại, các nhu, uh, tại gia đình và một số khu vực thương mại còn về vấn đề phát triển của trạm sạc cho xe ô tô thì hiện nay mới và bước vào giai đoạn mới phát triển thì hiện nay có thể nói Vinfast là một trong những cái đơn vị đầu tiên đi tiên phong về phát triển hệ thống trạm sạc điện thì tính đến tháng 10 năm 2021 Vinfast đó khoảng gần 1.400 trạm sạc trên toàn quốc và đang tiếp tục triển khai xây dựng khoảng 700 trạm sạc với mục tiêu của doanh nghiệp này là đến hết năm 2021 sẽ đạt trên khoảng độ 2.100 trạm sạc với 40.000 cổng sạc tại các khu vực trung cư, trạm xăng dầu, trạm dừng nghỉ, bãi đỗ xe trên toàn quốc. thì bên cạnh tiến phát thì có có một số trạm sạc được triển khai thí điểm tại thành phố Đà Nẵng và trong khu vực nghiên cứu nội bộ của các nhà sản xuất được đặt trên toàn quốc. thì về hiện nay thì hầu hết các cái trạm sạc đều tập trung tại các đô thị lớn như là Hà Nội, Thành phố Hồ Chí Minh và Đà Nẵng thì cụ thể hiện nay Hà Nội có khoảng 754 trạm sạc gồm 92 chạm sạc hỗn hợp, 480 chạm sạc ô tô, và AC xe máy và 182 chạm sạc DC ô tô. Và thành phố Hồ Chí Minh thì có 621 chạm sạc, trong đó có 79 chạm sạc hỗn hợp, 465 chạm sạc ô tô và xe máy và 77 chạm sạc DC cho ô tô. Thì ở Đà Nẵng thì hiện nay ngoài cái chạm sạc của Vinfast tại khu vực quận Hải Châu thì có 4 chạm sạc ô tô điện đang nghiên cứu đầu tư lắp đặt bởi Tổng công ty Điện lực miền Trung phối hợp với Tổng công ty Dầu Việt Nam và một trạm sạc của công ty Mitsubishi Moto thì như thấy chúng ta để thấy là hầu hết các trạm sạc hiện nay thì phần lớn vẫn là độ phủ là của Vinfast mà một số các doanh nghiệp đang nghiên cứu triển khai hệ thống trạm sạc thì theo kế hoạch triển khai của Vinfast trên toàn quốc thì hệ thống trạm sạc của Vinfast tập trung chủ yếu là các khu vực thành phố trung ương <cười> trong đó 70% sẽ nằm ở Hà Nội, Hồ Chí Minh, Đà Nẵng, Cần Thơ và Hải Phòng và ở Khánh Hòa trong tương lai 24% còn lại nằm ở các tỉnh thành phố còn lại và 6% nằm trên mạng lưới quốc lộ như vậy chúng ta có thể thấy là phần lớn là định hướng của doanh nghiệp sẽ nằm vào các khu vực thành phố có mật độ dân cư cao và việc bố trí chạm sạc khó khăn còn các đô thị còn lại đối với việc bố trí chạm sạc tại gia đình thuận lợi hơn thì cái việc chú trọng việc phát triển các chạm sạc nó sẽ hạn chế lại về các mô hình chạm sạc hiện nay thì nó có ba mô hình chạm sạc chủ yếu là mô hình chạm sạc 60 kW thì cung cấp để nguồn điện một chiều để sạc tiếp và có mỗi thiết bị có khoảng hai cổng sạc thời gian sạc khoảng từ 30 đến 90 phút Mô hình thứ hai là khoảng 30 kW được trang bị tại các trạm dừng nghỉ, bãi đỗ xe công cộng và thời gian sạc từ khoảng 40 đến 120 phút cho 80% dung lượng pin. Và mô hình thứ ba là mô hình 11 kW được trang bị tại các bãi đỗ xe công cộng, thời gian sạc đầy khoảng từ 6 đến 8 tiếng. Thì phần lớn các mô hình này thì sẽ phụ thuộc vào cái nhu cầu sử dụng và cái vị trí khai thác của các hệ thống trạm sạc để bố trí cho nó phù hợp. Thế về cách thách thức hiện nay trong việc triển khai mạng lưới trạm sạc trên toàn quốc thì đối với các thách thức lớn nhất hiện nay thì như tôi đánh giá có bao gồm có 6 cái thách thức lớn nhất đầu tiên đó là cái quỹ đất bố trí cho mạng lưới chạm sạc đặc biệt là tại khu vực đô thị lớn thành phố lớn thì như chúng ta đã biết cái nhu cầu xe điện cũng như là mật độ ô tô nói chung và mật độ ô tô điện nói riêng thì chủ yếu tập trung tại các khu vực thành phố lớn và ngay tại khu vực thành phố lớn hiện nay thì việc cái vị trí đỗ xe cá nhân đã là một vấn đề khó khăn do đó các vị trí đỗ xe cá nhân công cộng mà có bố trí chạm sạc cũng là một giải pháp vấn đề cần phải giải quyết thứ hai là chưa có quy chuẩn kỹ thuật quốc gia về hệ thống chạm sạc bao gồm cả quy chuẩn về mặt xây dựng cũng như là các cái quy chuẩn liên quan về mặt kỹ thuật do đó dẫn đến việc đầu tư các trạm sạc giữa các doanh nghiệp có thể sẽ không đồng bộ và lãng phí trong tương lai thứ ba là chúng ta chưa có quy hoạch tích hợp mạng lưới hạ tầng chạm sạc điện cả về số lượng quy mô tính chất trên toàn quốc và tại các thành phố thông thường đối với các quy hoạch xây dựng và quy hoạch đô thị thì chúng ta sẽ có các hạ tầng tiện ích công cộng ví dụ là bãi đỗ xe thì nhưng hiện nay về quy hoạch chúng ta chưa có quy hoạch bãi đỗ xe gắn liền với chạm sạc hoặc là các cái quy chuẩn về tỷ lệ bãi đỗ xe có chạm sạc hoặc là vị trí đỗ xe có chạm sạc tại các công trình như là thương mại, trường học, bệnh viện hoặc công trình thương mại khác. Thứ tư là về thách thức về nguồn cung cấp hạ tầng của mạng lưới quốc gia. thì theo đánh giá của EVN thì với nhu cầu phát
thì cái nhu cầu đó có thể tương đương với cả hai tổ máy của nhà máy điện Hòa Bình tức là công suất khoảng 240 MW hoặc tương đương với công suất của nhà máy điện Lai Châu 1200 MW như vậy chúng ta không thiếu cả về hệ thống điện cung cấp cũng như là hạ tầng lưới điện trước đây thì hạ tầng lưới điện chủ yếu là được xây dựng cho sinh hoạt do đó khi tích hợp cái hệ thống chạm sạc này tại các vị trí mà cùng với lưới điện sinh hoạt thì dẫn đến có thể dẫn đến là phụ tải gia tăng đó cũng là thách thức về an toàn đối với các chạm sạc trong khu vực dân cư và thứ sáu cũng là một thách thức mà rất nhiều doanh nghiệp và nhiều uh, quốc gia thì từ đối mặt đó là cái cơ chế phối hợp và chia sẻ hạ tầng chạm sạc giữa các doanh nghiệp trong việc phát triển chạm sạc do nhiều chạm, nhiều doanh nghiệp có định hướng là phát triển chạm sạc thành một trong những cái uh, chiến lược để cạnh tranh, tranh phát triển phương tiện của mình do đó cũng cần phải có những quy định cụ thể để phối hợp chia sẻ hạ tầng nhằm đảm bảo cái việc đầu tư hạ tầng có hiệu quả cũng như là khai thác tối đa giữa các doanh nghiệp đối với cái sáu cái vấn đề thách thức đó thì không phải chỉ tại mỗi tại Việt Nam và các quốc gia trên thế giới hiện nay trong quá trình phát triển chạm sạc thì đều vướng gặp phải. Thì do đó chúng tôi cũng đang nghiên cứu về cái kinh nghiệm quốc tế về phát triển chạm sạc, đặc biệt là tại các quốc gia có tốc độ phát triển nhanh về hệ thống chạm sạc. Cái đầu tiên là về kinh nghiệm của Thái Lan, thì các cái nỗ lực chính từ chính phủ thì đã đưa Thái Lan là một trong những quốc gia có triển khai được nhiều nhất khu vực Đông Nam Á về hệ thống chạm sạc. Thứ hai nữa là hỗ trợ đầu tư chính phủ đã có những cái chính sách hỗ trợ đầu tư và ưu đãi thuế cho doanh nghiệp kinh doanh hệ thống chạm sạc và bên cạnh đó thì đã thành lập được hiệp hội chạm sạc xe điện và kết hợp hoạt động của chạm sạc với việc chia sẻ dữ liệu được thành lập hiệp hội này cũng đảm bảo cái việc chia sẻ cái hệ thống hạ tầng chạm sạc giữa các doanh nghiệp với nhau và tăng cái khả năng tiếp cận của người sử dụng xe điện thứ ba là các sáng kiến thí điểm về lập kế hoạch cho mạng lưới điện thông minh cho chính phủ lãnh đạo thì bên cạnh các nỗ lực chính phủ này thì cũng các hạn chế còn lại như về hỗ trợ tài chính chưa đầy đủ và thiếu các ưu đãi phi tài chính cho người dùng và ưu đãi cho nhà sản xuất địa phương thứ hai là khả năng tương tác sạc và thay đổi quy trình kinh doanh thứ tư là bất tiện trong việc sử dụng các bộ sạc công cộng và thứ tư, tư là khó khăn giữa các nhà khai thác và chạm xe sạc điện và tiếp theo chúng tôi muốn nói đến đó là Trung Quốc đây cũng là một trong quốc gia có cái tốc độ phát triển chạm sạc và đầu của thế giới thì hiện nay thì Trung Quốc đang dẫn đầu trong việc triển khai hệ thống các chạm sạc công cộng và có kế hoạch cũng như là lộ trình cụ thể trong việc triển khai hạ tầng chạm sạc cho từng giai đoạn để phù hợp với tốc độ phát triển phương tiện của quốc gia và các đô thị và ngoài bên cạnh đó thì chính phủ cũng có quy định về các cái điểm sạc xe bắt buộc tại các địa điểm chính để đảm bảo tỷ lệ chạm sạc trên các vị trí đỗ xe và đầu tư trực tiếp của chính phủ cũng đã góp phần cùng với sự đầu tư của tư nhân cũng đã góp phần đẩy nhanh tốc độ phủ cái mạng lưới chạm sạc của Trung Quốc trong giai đoạn vừa qua và ngoài ra thì một trong những chính sách rất là quan trọng là giảm giá điện sạc và giới hạn phí dịch vụ cũng đã khuyến khích các nhà đầu tư tham gia vào cung cấp dịch vụ chạm sạc cũng như là hỗ trợ người sử dụng kinh nghiệm của nước quốc gia thứ hai khu vực tiếp theo là đài loan thì đối với đài loan thì chính phủ đã trợ cấp lắp đặt cho các chạm sạc điểm đối pin và hệ thống lưới điện thông minh ngoài ra thì các chính sách khuyến khích về cung cấp hạ tầng sạc điện các chính sách về khuyến khích về hệ thống đường truyền mạng lưới điện cung cấp cho hệ thống chạm sạc cũng đã hỗ trợ Thứ ba là xây dựng các quy định bắt buộc lắp đặt chạm sạc trong tương lai và các chiến lược về quản lý tiêu thụ về điện năng cũng như theo từng cấp và phân khúc khách hàng để giảm mức sử dụng vào giờ cao điểm. Thì cái, những cái chính sách này thì bên giai đoạn đầu khi triển khai cũng gặp phải các phản ứng của xã hội đối với chương trình thí điểm và các quãng đường truyền tải điện lớn và sự kết nối hệ thống điện cũng ảnh hưởng đến việc triển khai. Tuy nhiên thì dưới các chính sách và nỗ lực chính phủ thì cũng đã được triển khai hệ thống chạm sạc của Đài Loan đã được triển khai tương đối là hiệu quả thì đối với các của một quốc gia khác của châu Âu là Anh thì Anh cũng gặp rất là nhiều cái hạn chế về phát triển chạm sạc đặc biệt là cái vấn đề phức tạp về quyền sử dụng đất và quyền sử dụng đất và sở hữu tạo trở ngại cho hạ tầng chạm sạc do London là một trong những cái khu vực mà có chi phí uh, giá thành mặt bằng đất đắt đỏ nhất trên thế giới và cung ứng xe điện thì các cái nỗ lực của chính phủ cũng đang góp phần giải quyết những bất cập này đó là xây dựng một cái đề án quốc gia dành riêng cho trung, uh, cung cấp kinh phí lắp đặt chạm sạc bằng dụng sử dụng thấp trong giai đoạn đầu để đảm bảo có cái hạ tầng cơ bản đối với phương tiện điện. Thứ hai là thay đổi các cái tiêu chuẩn quy hoạch để hỗ trợ cho việc lắp đặt chạm sạc. Thứ ba là ưu đãi cho các điểm sạc công cộng, thương mại và nội bộ, đặc biệt là các khu vực ít sử dụng. Do các khu vực ít sử dụng này thì khả năng tái đầu tái thu hồi vốn rất là thấp, do đó là phải có những cái chính sách ưu đãi cụ thể. Thứ tư tiếp theo là mạng lưới chạm sạc bắt buộc để đảm bảo cái độ phủ của hệ thống chạm sạc và thứ năm là phải tập trung vào giảm phát thải carbon của mạng lưới điện và chính sách của nhà máy điện. Để các tốc độ sạc và mô hình sạ
có rất nhiều các cấp độ sạc điện khác nhau và cái việc lựa chọn các cấp độ sạc điện cũng như là cái mô hình chạm sạc này nó rất là quan trọng trong đến việc phát triển mạng lưới điện. thì trong nghiên cứu hiện nay có ba cấp độ về sạc được phân loại dựa trên cấp độ sạc chậm, trung bình và nhanh và tùy theo cấp độ sạc các hãng sản xuất xe và thị trường sẽ sử dụng các chuẩn kết nối khác nhau và các cấp độ này cũng sẽ xây dựng cho các cái vị trí và mạng lưới sạc khác nhau và mạng lưới sạc của chúng ta phải đảm bảo phân bổ đồng đều giữa ba cấp độ sạc này để đảm bảo hiệu quả về kết nối và cũng tạo điều kiện thuận lợi cho người sử dụng phương tiện điện. Đối với cấp độ thứ nhất là sạc 112V thì tại Mỹ thì đây là cấp độ sạc cơ bản sử dụng điện sinh hoạt trong các hộ gia đình. Thì đối với cấp độ này thì chúng ta có thể phủ mạng lưới sạc gia đình đối với các cái khu vực mà có mật độ dân cư thấp và ưu điểm là bất cứ nguồn điện nào cũng sẽ có để sử dụng để sạc pin ra xe và khuyết điểm là cái sạc này rất là chậm. Thì chủ yếu là nó sẽ phù hợp cho việc chúng ta sạc tại gia đình. Cấp độ sạc thứ hai là 240V thì cấp độ này sẽ giúp xe nạp năng lượng nhanh hơn, nhiều hơn so với cấp 1. Và hình thức sạc này sẽ phải có chạm sạc và xuất điện phổ yếu tại các chạm sạc công cấp ở các tòa nhà văn phòng, chung cư và bãi đỗ xe. Đấy thì về cơ bản hiện nay ở châu Âu và hết các nước trên thế giới trong đó Việt Nam thì chủ yếu là sử dụng điện áp trên 220V và level 2 này sẽ là cái cấp độ sạc cơ bản để triển khai. Về cấp độ 3 là cấp độ 480V, đây là cái loại sạc nhanh sử dụng điện một chiều, điện áp cao thay vì điện xoay chiều thì do đó là sẽ phải có cái yêu cầu về bố trí về nguồn điện nó sẽ phức tạp hơn và cấp sạc nhanh này thì thường thì xuất hiện các chạm sạc nhanh được các công ty điện hoặc sạc hãng xe xây dựng thì đối với các cái tuyến như tuyến quốc lộ hoặc là tuyến cao tốc thì việc sạc nhanh này sẽ đòi hỏi cái chuẩn sạc riêng và như vậy chúng ta có thể thấy là cái chạm sạc mà chủ yếu chủ, uh, chủ yếu phổ biến ở khu vực đô thị sẽ là chạm sạc ở cấp độ level hai thế do đó thì theo nghiên cứu thì để tiếp cận người sử dụng tốt nhất và thì um, trong tính động cơ và thực uh, tốt trong việc cung cấp nhiên liệu thì ngoài cái tiêu chuẩn về chạm sạc cấp độ 2 mà nhiều nước áp dụng thì chúng ta vẫn phải bổ sung thêm một số vị trí có mô hình về cấp độ 3 để đảm bảo về cái tốc độ sạc trên toàn quốc. À, thì trên cơ sở những cái phân tích mà đánh giá những cái khó khăn bất cập cũng như là cái kinh nghiệm của các quốc gia trong cái việc phát triển mạng lưới chạm sạc thì chúng tôi cũng đề xuất một số cái uh, giải pháp cũng như chính sách để nâng cao cái vai trò của chính phủ trong việc thiết lập mạng lưới chạm sạc. thì đầu tiên đòi hỏi đầu tiên là chúng ta phải hoàn thiện hệ thống tiêu chuẩn quy chuẩn liên quan đến chạm sạc. không phải chỉ riêng tiêu chuẩn quy chuẩn xây dựng, tiêu chuẩn kỹ thuật của hệ thống sạc để đảm bảo hệ thống sạc có đồng nhất mà phải bao gồm cả các quy chuẩn tiêu chuẩn quy định về tỷ lệ uh, vị trí đỗ xe có chạm sạc tại các cái khu vực thương mại, trường học, bệnh viện, tỷ lệ về vị trí đỗ xe có chạm sạc tại các cái chung cư việc thay đổi hiện nay thì chúng ta mới chỉ có quy định về tỷ lệ về vị trí đỗ xe trên diện tích của các cái khu thương mại thôi hiện và chúng ta sẽ tiếp tục phải bổ sung thêm tỷ lệ về số lượng vị trí đỗ xe có chạm sạc điện trong tổng vị trí đỗ xe để cung cấp cái mạng lưới chạm sạc thứ hai là chúng ta sẽ phải bổ sung yêu cầu về quy hoạch hệ thống chạm sạc trong các quy hoạch liên quan đặc biệt là hệ thống quy hoạch xây dựng và quy hoạch sử dụng đất để ngay từ khi bắt đầu triển khai các quy hoạch sử dụng đất về khu đô thị chúng ta đã dành cho phát triển hệ thống chạm sạc đặc biệt là chạm sạc công cộng thứ ba là chúng ta phải xây dựng được cái lộ trình phát triển mạng lưới chạm sạc tại các đô thị lớn trong cái chương trình quốc gia về phát triển phương tiện giao thông vận tải hệ thống giao thông vận tải công cộng thân thiện với môi trường trong đó có phương tiện giao thông điện thì hiện nay bộ giao thông vận tải đang được chính phủ giao là đơn vị thực hiện xây dựng cái chương trình quốc gia này thì trong chương trình quốc gia này chúng ta có thể xây dựng được các lộ trình phát triển mạng lưới chạm sạc cũng như là đề xuất quy mô cũng như là số lượng chạm sạc cụ thể đối với từng thành phố một và trên các thành phố trên cơ sở cái chương trình cụ thể đó sẽ có những cái chương trình chi tiết để xây dựng hệ thống chạm sạc trong thành phố mình và thứ tư là phải xây dựng được các cơ chế chính sách khuyến khích phát triển chạm sạc công cộng bao gồm các chính sách về hỗ trợ về thuế nhập khẩu đối với thiết bị sạc các chính sách về giảm phí giảm thuế giảm phí hoặc là uh, giảm uh, thuế uh, giảm thuế sử dụng đất giảm uh, các loại thuế trong quá trình khai thác cũng như là hỗ trợ doanh nghiệp khác thì trên đây là những cái nội dung cơ bản của tôi trình bày về những cái khó khăn thách thức trong việc triển khai uh, khó khăn thách thức trong việc triển khai hệ thống chạm sạc điện và những cái vai trò của chính phủ trong thời gian tới thì cũng hy vọng là những cái đề xuất về vai trò của chính phủ này có thể sớm được cụ thể hóa thành các chính sách cụ thể và hiện thực hóa giúp điều kiện để, để uh, tạo điều kiện để cho các doanh nghiệp cũng như là các tổ chức có thể phát triển hệ thống mạng lưới chạm sạc điện trên địa bàn các đô thị lớn của Việt Nam trong tương lai xin trân trọng cảm ơn Vâng ạ, xin trân trọng cảm ơn anh Phan Hoài Phương với một cái bài trình bày rất là cụ thể, chi tiết cùng rất là nhiều
uh, thank you, Mr. Fan Hoi Phuong, for delivering the presentation on the status and challenges and the roles of the government in managing station network establishment in Vietnam. Uh, trước khi uh, chuyển uh, sang phần uh, hỏi đáp thì tôi xin phép được uh, tóm tắt một số cái nội dung chính cho các uh, uh, học viên uh, nước ngoài ạ. Uh, now I would like to briefly summarize some main points of the presentation from Mr. Phan Hoài Phương. Uh, in Vietnam, domestic automobile enterprises have been investing resources and finance to lead the research and development of electric vehicle. Uh, for fast charging station. Vietnam automobile industry de development has uh, the strategies to uh, 2025, vision to 2035, uh, which approved by the prime minister have clearly defined that encouraging production environmentally friendly vehicle, fuel saving car, hybrid car, electric vehicle to meet the requirement for emission standard according to the uh, roadmap. And also the, uh, the government also uh, issues the strategies on development of automobile industries in sync with the development of transport infrastructures. Vietnam also sets some world for green transport to account for 25 to 30 percent by 2030. There are some contribution and green development strategies such as uh, cut out uh, 5 to 7 percent of greenhouse gas emission. Moreover, the current status of charging in station infrastructures and plans of Vietnam uh, we have uh, deployed electric charging station using renewable energy. We have the plan to expand the network of charging station throughout the city. However, in Vietnam, we still lack requirement on technical characteristics and standards for design manufacturing and installation of charging infrastructures. We do not have uh, regulation on battery handling and recovery or regulation on operation and registration for EV. So uh, Mr. Phan Hoi Phuong also suggests that it is necessary to promote mechanism and policies for public transport using clean energy such as electric car and hybrid car. He also indicates that uh, we need mechanism for management and development of the network of charging station in urban area, residential area, highway, and national highways. So here's are some main points from the presentation of Peter Phan Hoi Phuong. Thank you for the presentation. If you have any question to ask Mr. Phan Hoi Phuong, please feel free to uh, indicate in the chat box or ask him directly. MS Nếu các vị học viên ở đây ạ, có câu hỏi hay là thắc mắc gì muốn trao đổi cùng anh Phan Hoài Phương thì mọi người có thể đặt câu hỏi trong phần chat box hoặc là nhắn tin lên đó để được hỏi câu hỏi một cách trực tiếp ạ. So the next speaker for today's session is Mr. Sacha Van Duyck. He is a project manager and consultant at FIER Automotive and Mobility. À, xin giới thiệu à, diễn giả tiếp theo của buổi họp ngày hôm nay đấy là ông San Chavan de Witt. Ông San Chavan de Witt là một à, à, là giám đốc quản lý dự án và chuyên gia tư vấn của công ty Fear. Với à, ông à, Van, ông San Chavan de Witt thì có kinh nghiệm rất là nhiều năm trong cái lĩnh vực à, làm các cái dự án quốc tế cũng như dự án trong quốc gia à, tập trung vào cái việc là um, giao thông bằng xe điện cũng như là sự khác biệt trong các cái chính sách hỗ trợ cho các uh, phương tiện giao thông sử dụng uh, nhiên liệu sạch trong các quốc gia. Ở trong buổi học ngày hôm nay thì ông Santras Van de Witt sẽ trình bày bài giảng về hạ tầng sạc điện, các tiêu chuẩn kỹ thuật, hướng dẫn quy hoạch mạng lưới và quản lý lưới điện.
Now I would like to welcome Mr. Shang Chavon the Wick. Um, he will presenting the charging infrastructure, charging station, technical standard, and guide the network planning at electricity grid management. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can see. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, indeed, I'm going to tell you something about charging infrastructure and then especially about the standards and the guidance of the network planning. And let me go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is the agenda. Um, I hope everything is readable for everyone. Uh, so it's in English and it's in Vietnamese. Thank you for the translation as well. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the importance of the EV infrastructure. Um, that might be obvious to some, but I want to reiterate that a little bit. And then about the different typologies of infrastructure, uh, something about the technical specifications and interoperability, some city planning, uh, actually a lot of city planning, uh, I have to talk about that, uh, and about the innovation and trends. So first, the importance of EV infrastructure. So why is the EV infrastructure, the recharging infrastructure, is it important? Well, simply said, uh, without recharging infrastructure, you don't have any sustainable mobility. There's no business case for this. Simply said, you need to get the vehicle moving. And to get the vehicle moving, you need to have su sufficiently available recharging stations uh, with sufficient power available per charging station. That's needed um, uh, in an abundance, actually, to have satisfied customers and that's what you do it for uh, if you don't have satisfied customers if they don't see it as reliable if they don't see it as user friendly they won't use the evs that you uh, that are on the market and then you don't have any sustainable mobility so that's why it's always a chicken and egg uh, problem but if you don't have recharging infrastructure you don't get any evs on the market so you need to have the ev driver happy so you need to take away its concerns uh, and on the right hand side here, you can see uh, research by uh, McKinsey in 2016 and 2019 uh, about the concerns of EV drivers. <clears throat> Sorry. And you can see that um, battery and charging, it was in 2016 uh, the lowest concern actually for EV drivers, but in 2019 it was the biggest concern. So you see that all the other concerns are going away a little bit. So vehicle availability um, and the uh, car experience, the, those are. Concerns has gone away. People have faith in the EVs, but they don't have faith in battery or recharging, at least not yet. So it's really important to tackle this issue um, uh, head on. So we did research about this uh, quite a lot, and there are four main KPIs uh, that are important for the recharging infrastructure. First is, uh, I already mentioned this, sufficient coverage. So you need to have um, sufficiently available recharging infrastructure. If you drive down a highway and you have uh, to drive 200 kilometers uh, for a fast charger while your capacity is only 100 kilometers, that's not sufficient. Uh, it will also drive people away from EV because it's too difficult. Same thing with seamless charging. Seamless charging means that you can cross borders uh, and cross cities actually um, and pay with the same app, with the same card, um, same payment method uh, to make it easy again, seamless for the user. Then payment itself, it needs to be transparent. Uh, the cost needs to be transparent and it's it's sort of an open door maybe, uh, but a lot of times actually, certainly in the beginning, um, there are different charging stations where you don't know what you're going to pay. So you only know in hindsight, it's of course, um, yeah, not sufficiently, uh, so not sufficiently transparent for an EV user. And fourth is uh, the facility. So recharging obviously takes longer than filling up a gas tank. So there needs some, need to be some facilities available. Then about the different typologies of recharging. Uh, and this, uh, this image of uh, different icons shows there are a lot of different places in which you can recharge. And I think uh, I couldn't understand the last presentation, but I saw the images. I think that was explained there as well. So you have recharging at work, you have recharging on a highway, at home, at a shopping mall, cinema, theater, um, also in shared, um, shared living quarters. There are different types of recharging, so you need to keep that in mind. It's not just one sort. And besides that there are different sorts of recharging infrastructure, there are also different sorts of vehicles using this infrastructure. 
Uh, and obviously not all vehicles can use the same infrastructure. So you have cabs, you have uh, trucks, you have buses, school buses, uh, but also delivery, you have delivery vans, you have light commercial vehicles, um, two wheelers, of course, and all these different vehicles need different uh, infrastructure, uh, but you can also combine these, but it's just the fact that uh, a truck uh, will need a much higher, higher voltage and higher power than uh, an electric uh, two-wheeler. And this is combined in this slide, actually. Um, yeah, this, these are images, so they're not translated, but it, it shows different charging profiles. Uh, and every different charging profile serves a different customer or different user. Uh, so at the top left corner, you have charging at home. Uh, this serves, for instance, uh, and it's only an example, a commuter that, that, that only drives a couple of tens of a couple of 10 kilometers uh, a day um, as a sufficient charge to go back again and charge at home. There might be some people commuting, um, but they don't have the availability to charge at home, so they need to have public charging. And then you have, of course, vans, utility vans that drive a lot and need uh, rapid charging during the day to complete their day. Point is, you have all these different type of, types of charging and all these different types serve a different customer. And there are choices to be made here. So it is uh, public charging, as you see, it's a public private charging in public areas, but also a lot of charging is done on private property. So at offices, um, uh, at recreational, but private recreational areas or at homes, um, and choices can be made which customers to serve. Then about the technical specifications and interoperability. Uh, I actually saw this image in the previous slide, but I think it was skipped over. So let me briefly address this. It is important to have uh, to set standards. Uh, and as you can see, um, all around the world, standards are set, but also large areas where no standard is set. And uh, if you don't set any standards, you can have different plugs. Uh, and that's, of course, very difficult because then you have to build. Uh, yeah, there are four different standards, roughly. Uh, then you have to work, build four, five, four times as many recharging infrastructure, uh, charging stations to uh, to serve everybody. Um, yeah, I don't won't go in too deep, but uh, the EU, the CCS2, and the CCS1 in North America are the most widespread. And then you have in China the GB2, the GBT, and the Shademo in uh, in Japan. Um, and here I want to show you that, that there are different solutions also for different vehicle types. So I explained this already a little bit. Um, with the different icons, so the different vehicles need different uh, different solutions, but also the future solutions can be different per vehicle. Uh, so you see uh, with the, the Renault there, the Renault Zoe in the image on the top right corner with induction charging. So you drive over a road and there's wireless charging to your battery. Um, that only works, uh, assumingly, uh, with big person vehicles, uh, private vehicles, lowers battery sizes that probably won't work for what you see on the left-hand side for heavy duty, uh, duty trucks. Um, but it means also there are gonna be different standards for these different types of charging. And here I want to take you to one scenario, one example. And it's only one example because this, this, every vehicle has its own examples, uh, but it's for an e-bus. So here into three different scenarios. The first one is standard charging overnight. So that's uh, low power, well, relatively low power because 10 to 50 kilowatts is uh, is high power for some vehicles, but for bus with a high capacity of battery, it needs that kind of power for to charge full overnight. Uh, the first scenario, you don't have any fast charging along the route. So you need a very big battery to drive, let's say three routes a day, a bus drives three routes a day. Uh, it needs a very big battery. That's gonna cost a lot of money because batteries are expensive and they're heavy. So you can see you need upwards uh, up to 450 kilowatt hours in battery. And that's gonna weigh four and a half thousand kilograms so that's a lot and also uh, makes that you can take less passengers because you have needs all this room and this weight for the, for the batteries second option is opportunity charging at the final stops so you have three routes let's say you have three routes and you have opportunity charging so fast charging after every route so let's say three times a day it means that your battery capacity goes down to 150 kilowatt hours that's a big difference also in weight does mean, however, that you need to install fast charging stations, which are also really expensive. And you have other things to worry about, like grid connections. Uh, but then again, you can take more passengers. And the third option is uh, opportunity fast charging also at intermediate stops. So even 
more often fast charging. It means that again, your battery capacity can go down, also the weight of the battery can go down, but you have to install more fast chargers. So the cost gets placed and, uh, elsewhere. Um, an important factor here as well is the, the, the battery life. So if you have more fast charging, battery life goes down somewhat uh, compared to standard charging overnight. Um, there's not to say that there is one option better than the others. It's really specific to every situation, but this is just to give you an example of the opportunities that there are. And here I want to show you the, the overall EV charging market or the recharging market. So it's really important to have open standard protocols. Uh, as you can see, the EV user uh, needs to connect to the recharging station. Um, while connecting, there needs to be communication between the car or the uh, moped or the trike or the bus with the rechar uh, recharging station. There needs to be communication. If there's no um, same protocol in there, then the communication will work and you can't charge. Um, and this holds for every chain, every link in the chain. So it's important to have these open standards uh, mainly because um, if you don't have open standards, you can have a proprietary system. With a proprietary system, you can have competition logout and customer login. Well, I'll explain what that is. If you have a competition logout, let's say the charging point operator um, will get a monopoly because only his protocol is being used and the other ones don't have that protocol. Meaning that the other companies, charging point operators, cannot join in the market. If they cannot join in the market, there won't be any competition with a monopoly and the prices will rise. So this is bad for also for innovation, but also for the EV user because prices go up. Uh, and then he has a competition uh, because there's competition logout. It can also be a customer login. When a customer has a vehicle by uh, manufacturer X uh, and that only works with that charger of, man of the manufacturer. So, he cannot go any, anywhere else. And there's basically the same situation of a monopoly again. Um, it's easier said than done, of course, to get the open market and the open protocols all working. Because as you can see, this is an example from, uh, from Europe. There is a lot of different players in the market. There is some uh, vertical integration. Well, this image is horizontal. But uh, it, all these different partners need to be aligned. And through this standardization, which can be set, of course, also by governments. Uh, you enable interoperability and also competition. Um, it's not to say that if you have um, interoperability that uh, in practice or in uh, technical terms, it will be working in practice as well. This is an example, um, and that's, that's still true today in, uh, in Europe. Uh, you need a lot of different apps and a lot of different parts to be sure that you can pay at certain recharging point. Um, I've experienced this myself actually uh, over the summer when, uh, when driving around in Europe somewhat. Um, there are a lot, lot of different recharging points where you need to download a new app, you need to sign in, sometimes even give a, a, a photo of your passport or something, and what if you didn't have it on you, um, to just recharge. And uh, of course, it needs to be easy, um, and it needs to be uh, no roaming cost. Everybody needs to go and charge his car where he wants to. Also, as I also mentioned this in the KPIs, of course. Uh, yeah, we'll brief about the interoperability. I also mentioned this already, uh, but interoperability is the ability of vehicles and chargers, um, of vehicles, chargers and networks and management systems to interact with each other and manage data uh, on a standardized basis. Uh, so this, this makes sure that there's safety, there's compatibility, uh, compatibility, functionality, system reliability and availability between all these different actors in the in the chain. So now about the main uh, the main topic, uh, city planning. When thinking of city planning for recharging infrastructure, uh, I want to take, take to a real uh, simple example. So imagine that an EV driver comes to city hall and asks, uh, um, uh, tells you I have an EV now, but I don't have recharging infrastructure. Can you help me? The First option would be at the private recharging at their own premise. If that's not an, if that's not a possibility, that would be great because uh, that's the easiest. That's the easiest because it won't take any public space and it won't cost you any money as an uh, authority. Then the second option is sort of a half-half, either have uh, private parking at a public area or uh, uh, a private uh, 
public recharging at a public area. And the last option is public recharging. There's different influence in every level. So with public recharging, the authority is completely in, in control. It can set all the rules, um, but it takes up public space. And now get back to examples on this later, but this is real simple uh, what you're thinking of. This is more, uh, it's more difficult than that, to be honest, because there are uh, a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, and these factors I've tried to, to image here in different layers. So the first layer might be that you look at charges that are already in place. So you look around the city, where are already recharging points? Then you go to the next layer, um, the current capacity of those recharging points. You can see, well, uh, you say that this EV driver tells me that I uh, that he needs recharging at a certain point, but there already are rechargers uh, and they have availability, so it's not needed. Um, then you look at the new requests from inhabitants or companies. So um, what's going to future be like in that area? And so you have all these different layers that are important to determine uh, where recharging infrastructure is needed. Um, a really important one, actually, I didn't mention yet, is, is, the, is the grid, for instance. Uh, but I, I will talk about the, about the a little bit later. Also, social economic uh, uh, research is, is important, but it's not one thing. It's everything together that makes uh, a choice of recharging infrastructure. It's, it's not only about the data, though. So you can have these, these beautiful maps in your research, but it's always important in the end to go to the location and to check whether a certain location that you identified is actually suited. Um, yeah, if we'll, I will talk about this a little bit later, so I'll skip this for now. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about this. The, um, work with the utility company. So it's really important, um, as probably everyone knows, uh, to work with uh, the grid company, the utility company. The grid is going to see a lot more strain in the next three years uh, all around the world with upcoming EVs, uh, upcoming uh, renewable energy. Um, so it's really important to work with them. And the map on the right hand side, I'm not sure if you can see, um, there are a couple of red dots uh, and they, because there the capacity on the grid is really low and there are green dots where the capacity is still sufficient. So this is a really important one to, uh, to invest in, uh, to your connection with the utility company, because it can save you a lot of cost. I will go come back to the cost in a, in a, in a bit, um, but it's really important. And I think everybody understands that. Uh, and it's important in the future uh, as well, uh, more because uh, the, um, the simple truth is that on the right top corner, you see the, the flow basically of the energy usage through the day. So in the morning, you have a peak and in the evening you have a peak and it can differ per location, but generally this is the case in, uh, in every country. Um, and you see that the evening peak will be higher and the morning peak will be higher with uh, charging of electric vehicles. There are new technologies that can take this away, but uh, those are not implemented everywhere and it's really difficult to manage. Um, so it's really important to make sure that if you have a room on a, on, a, on a grid at a certain location that you install recharging infrastructure there. Of course, again, assuming that this is just one of the layers uh, and all the layers needs to, needs to be combined, but this is a really important layer. Yeah, real brief about business opportunities. So it's important to create business opportunities um, for EV charging. Making sure that there, for instance, are city hubs where different types of vehicles can charge. So you have a higher utilization rate of the charging location. Um, that means that it's easier for market players also to get into the market and make sure that not all the costs uh, fall on the, uh, um, uh, fall on the user or on the city. It is important though, when uh, putting market players into, uh, into recharging, that the data remains available for a city. Um, when a private company moves into this market, it of course gonna wanna handle the data uh, because the data, uh, of course, nowadays is just worth money on its own already, but they can map the entire need of recharging. For instance, you see here, the unique users per charging point or um, the unique users yearly for a charging point or in a city, um, you can see what's needed in the market. And if uh, the private company has access to this, but the city doesn't, that means that there's a power shift. Uh, and as a city, you want to remain in control. So it's really, really important to keep a hold of this data. 
and these are just examples uh, of the data that you can uh, you can extract but there's much much more you can uh, and this is about the uh, 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 i mentioned to come back to this about the cost of the electricity network um so it's really really expensive to um to increase the electricity network it's going to be needed uh, all around the world because uh, energy usage with uh, more sustainability is going up that's for sure um but if you can decrease it by a little bit, it will save you a lot of money already. Um, so you don't only need a grid connection, but then you need a transformer and a power cabinet and then a charging point. And at every step, uh, there needs to be civil work. So you need to dig, you need to put energy cables in the ground and you need to buy the, the transformer house uh, and buy the power cabinet. It needs to be serviced, needs to be maintenance. Um, so it's really important, again, to work with the utility company. Then, um, oh, there's uh, one slide missing, but this is this is about uh, city planning, and then uh, what I just talked about in the previous slides about city planning is really about the mapping, about looking for the right locations. Now I'm going a little bit more into the policies you can uh, you can extract or you can use to extract the best utilization for your network uh, and increase EV usage. So this is about uh, a lot about the occupancy rate of public recharges, or better said, maybe the utilization rate. And with that, I mean uh, the actual time that a vehicle is charging at a recharging point. So if a electric vehicle is parked at a recharger for 24 hours, but it's only charging for 10 hours, then the utilization rate or the occupancy rate is only 10. Because the other part of the time it's parked there, the other 14 hours, it's not needed for it to be at a recharging location. It can also be at a normal parking spot and it's really important to keep in mind on this keep this in mind and to keep it um if you incentivize this right and you increase the occupancy rate you reduce the use of public space reduce the installation and maintenance cost and reduce the investment cost simply because you're reducing the amount of chargers needed there are two main policy streams that can be uh, used to get this is first is restricting the use of EV-enabled parking lots by non-EVs, so banning um, uh, motorbikes or trikes that run on petrol on an EV spot. Uh, and another one is to is different parking rates for the EV-enabled parking spots. So the first uh, direction of policy is restricting the use of EV-enabled parking lots by non-EVs. And there are three main streams that you can go by here. So first is to um, really only let vehicles use a parking spot while they are recharging. Uh, the image there that you see on the left uh, left hand side uh, is actually from a colleague of mine um, in front of his house. It says, uh, a banner says, uh, you can only park here uh, to charge if your car is fully charged between eight in the morning and 10 at night, you have to remove your car. And you can actually get a fine if you don't remove the car because you're not allowed to park in. The second option is to have only uh, parking parking only for EVs, uh, but it's not mandatory to move your car if um, if it's full. So that picture in the middle is actually in, from in front of my house. I don't have uh, a private driveway, so I need to recharge in public. Uh, but it's not mandatory to move the car. Uh, and if I look outside right now, I can see the car that's parked there for five days already, uh, blocking recharging for any other vehicle, uh, but still being parked there legally. And the last one is uh, parking for non-EVs. Um, also allowed on EV parking lots, but only in certain situations. Um, and you can see that these different uh, parking policies have different outcomes and they can be used to different uh, extents, of course. Um, if you want to uh, encourage EVs, then you want to make it as easy, as easy for them as possible, then the middle option might be the best. So they can park uh, on the EV parking spots uh, whenever uh, and they can charge if they want, but they don't have to charge. If you think, well, the recharging infrastructure is not really that great and we need to have a high utilization, uh, then the option on the left might be the best because then uh, all the EVs can use the recharging infrastructure available. The second policy stream here is um, different parking rates for EV-enabled parking lots. Um, so again, there are three different, uh, uh, I think not all is readable here, but I'll explain. Um, so you have free parking, regular parking, and progressive parking rates. Free parking, uh, title says it, um, you don't have to pay for your parking there. Uh, regular parking rates, you have to pay. And with progressive parking rates, 
you pay more uh, uh, all along your uh, part for a longer period of time. Again, this can be used for different ends. So if you want to encourage and incentivize EVs, free parking is the way to go because people will see that they see a, a monetary benefit there. So they won't, um, so they will buy an EV sooner uh, than when they have to pay more with an ICE. If you want to utilize your recharging infrastructure better, then progressive parking rates might be good. If somebody is parked at a, at a spot uh, recharging uh, and after five hours his car is full or his vehicle is full uh, and he needs to move, um, but there's no, no, men, no fine in, in place, then he won't do it properly. But if there's progressive parking rates, so if he starts to pay more every hour after that, then probably he's going to move his car. Uh, and this is an example uh, of how this is uh, put in place actually in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. So really in the beginning, in 2012 and 13, uh, there weren't that many EVs yet, and the city wanted to incentivize the EV ownership. Uh, and along the canals and in, in Amsterdam, there's really, really little parking space available. But it said to EV owners, well, if you buy an EV, uh, then you can have, can have a designated parking spot for yourself with a recharging point in front of your door. Uh, there was a huge incentive, so people that could afford it uh, back then, uh, because this was really expensive still, of course, um, they bought an EV because they could have their own private parking spot in front of their door. It was, it was amazing. That took off, uh, and too many places got, uh, got personalized, so to say, so they moved it to only free parking. So you don't have your own designated parking spot, but you have free parking. So still incentivizing EVs, um, but not to the extent that you get a free parking spot. Now that has moved away as well because there, the EVs kept increasing and uh, uh, the regular parking was, was introduced for EVs as well. Uh, and you see now already that progressive parking is, is being talked about in some areas in Amsterdam to keep electric vehicles moving away from recharging points when they're full. Um, and there's one downside that I have to mention, I didn't mention before, to, to incentivizing EVs, um, because in the beginning, if there's a couple EVs, nobody would bother. Um, but there are a lot of examples actually where uh, non-EV drivers get really frustrated or annoyed uh, when EVs get all these benefits. So if there's free parking and an ICE vehicle is not allowed there, it is, um, they, they, they might get frustrated and there are examples, it actually has a name, it's being iced, um, where vehicles just block EV parking spaces uh, at the risk of a fine, but just, just out of frustration. So acceptance is really important here. Uh, so you need to balance it out, but of course you want to incentivize EVs. Uh, then about innovation and trends. So there are two big innovations that I want to talk about. The first one is smart charging. Again, I have the same, uh, same image, here, image here. So you have the, the flow of energy used throughout the day. Uh, and you see that the evening peak is being extended with the uh, charging of electric vehicles. It is possible to sh shift that charge um, over the day. So the graphs on the bottom uh, are actually analyses we did for, uh, for a company uh, at their office. And uh, so they have all these um, EVs there recharging. And you can see that the red line is their contract. Uh, so the amount of uh, electricity that they have in their contract that they can use, but it's, it's overshoots quite large, actually. Um, through technology, through smart charging, you can spread out the charging over a longer period of time. And if you do so, it makes sure that you won't go over, you overshoot your, your contract, so you won't pay more. Um, and it's easier on the grid. So it's good for um, stabilizing the grid. And the next one goes a little bit further. It has to do with smart charging as well, but it's vehicle to grid. So that basically means the name says it, you recharge also, you recharge your car or your other vehicle. Um, and when needed, when the grid asks for it and you have sufficient charge in your vehicle, you can deliver power back to the grid to stabilize it. And this is especially important with the, uh, the rise of renewable energies, uh, because yeah, it's simply said, uh, if sun shines during the day, you can take energy from that. Uh, but at night or in the evening, there's less sun available, so you won't have as, money, as much, much energy. Well, you see the uh, power demand throughout the day. In the evening, there won't be as much sun, but there's a high demand for energy. During the day, there's a low amount of uh, demand for energy, but there is a lot of energy available. So it's a perfect solution that vehicles can charge fully during the day, 
They both need their full charge in the evening so they can deliver some power back to the grid, stabilize the grid, uh, and make use of fossil, fossil energy um, redundant. Uh, the last slide, um, and this is a real important takeaway, I think, is the public procurement is a powerful tool. So I, managed, uh, I mentioned that uh, it's important to get market players into recharging because uh, you don't want all the costs to fall on the city or on private people on their home premise. Um, but the, the danger with that is that um, the market players will become king. So they won't have, will have a proprietary system, they will get a monopoly, uh, maybe they won't work together. But with, through public procurement, cities can uh, mandate interoperability, a seamless charging experience, and a positive business case for electro mobility, also for the EV user. It's really important. So not only for the companies for the recharge for recharging, but also for the EV user. So these are the KPIs I discussed earlier, and it can be that through public procurement, cities can mandate this. Thank you for your attention. This was my presentation. Uh, I hope you uh, uh, took away something from it. If you have any questions, uh, please ask. Okay, thank you very much for an informative and insightful presentation. Uh, we think that there are lots of valuable information and experiences we can apply to promote the charging infrastructure for EVs in Vietnam. The step, the strategies, and the way to cooperate with enterprises for city planning on charging infrastructures are also necessary for cities in Vietnam like Hanoi. And also the incentives for EVs are what the city trying to state to include in the regulation to encourage people to use EV instead of conventional vehicle. So I think that the, the presentation will really valuable for the cities in this situation. And uh, now I think that uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, xin cảm ơn Nam. Ông Sao Tra đã có một cái bài trình bày về rất là nhiều nội dung liên quan đến phương tiện chạy điện. Trước khi chuyển sang phần hỏi đáp, thì tôi xin phép được tóm tắt một số cái thông tin chính của bài trình bày của ông Santras. Mr. Santras, I would like to briefly summarize your presentation in Vietnamese for Vietnamese audience before we welcome the questions from the audience. Trong phần trình bày của mình thì ông Sancha đã chia sẻ về tầm quan trọng của các cơ sở hạ tầng xe điện, cơ sở hạ tầng sạc có thể là sạc di động và các cái loại hình kinh doanh có liên quan ạ. Về các cái yếu tố quan trọng nhất trong việc đánh giá các cái cơ sở hạ tầng sạc điện như là sạc điện mạch, sạc chéo hay là các cái vấn đề liên quan đến việc thanh toán các cái cơ sở ở À, hạ tầng liên quan đến sạc điện ạ. Phân loại về các cái địa điểm dành cho các cái trạm sạc xe điện có thể là cái địa điểm ở trên xa lộ, ở nhà hoặc là các cái khu sinh hoạt chung ạ. Đối với một số cái lưu ý thì ông có đưa ra đây là các cái phương tiện thì không phải là tất cả các phương tiện đều có thể sử dụng chung một cái cơ sở hạ tầng trạm sạc được vì có những cái yêu cầu về kỹ thuật riêng. Ví dụ như là nếu như là sạc ở nhà chẳng hạn thì cái khoảng cách lái xe có thể là ngắn rồi còn nếu như là sạc ở, dị, sạc ở trên đường hay là sạc ở các cái địa điểm nằm giữa cái lộ trình của chúng ta thì đều có những cái đặc tính riêng. Về các cái tiêu chuẩn thì có các cái giải pháp khác nhau liên quan đến các cái loại xe khác nhau. Ví dụ có chúng ta có các cái loại chạm sạc như là sạc à, tiêu chuẩn như chúng ta sẽ sạc qua đêm thì chúng ta sẽ có thể à, tính phí tại cái chạm sạc đó ở điểm dừng đó hay là chúng ta sạc ở trên cái lộ trình mà chúng ta đang đi tức là sạc nhanh ạ đấy cũng là có có những cái yêu cầu khác nhau đồng thời ông Sancha cũng đưa ra à, các cái tiêu chuẩn hóa cho cái khả năng tương tác và cạnh tranh đối với cái việc xây dựng chạm sạc ạ Các cách tiếp cận phân lớp để lên, lên cái kế hoạch từ phía thành phố để xây dựng các cái trạm sạc ạ. 
dung lượng các điện, các cái trạm sạc này như thế nào à, yêu cầu từ phía cư dân hoặc là các cái công ty về lưới điện hay là về vị trí đây là những cái yếu tố mà cần cân nhắc ạ Ngoài ra thì ông Hanh Trang cũng đưa ra một số cái khuyến nghị liên quan đến việc là thành phố có thể đưa ra những cái chính sách như thế nào để có thể khuyến khích cái việc sử dụng xe điện thay cho các cái phương tiện truyền thống. Thì đây là một số cái điểm nổi bật trong cái phần trình bày của ông Hanh Trang mà xin phép được tóm lược ạ. Bây giờ thì chúng ta sẽ chuyển sang phần hỏi và đáp. À, nếu như các anh chị có câu hỏi nào thì có thể cho lên phần chat box để chúng ta có thể trao đổi với diễn giả. Ở đây thì tôi đã à, nhìn thấy một câu hỏi rồi ạ. Then Mr. Sanchez, we have one question from the audience relating to the uh, the electricity price for charging. Yes, is there any difference in the electricity price for charging uh, the for the EVs and the price for electricity for normal use for commerce for industrial electricity? Is there any difference? So the difference between the price for electricity for recharging or for normal electric use? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that depends on the on the situation, of course. Uh, but I say there's no there's no difference. Um, what I know from uh, analysis we did in the Netherlands, um, you can see that actually when you need recharging for an electric vehicle, or at least when you need large parking lots with a lot of different recharging, you need to have a larger grid connection. Uh, that actually makes the price of your electricity go down. But of course, you need a lot of investment cost. Um, but in general, uh, the, the cheapest way for recharging is at your home premise, um, because there you have uh, the least uh, amount of investment. Yes, thank you. Nhiều sáng chắc có chia sẻ. Thank you for your answers. I uh, need to translate to the young. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. À, như ông Sancha có chia sẻ thì uh, cái um, giá điện thì không có sự thay đổi ạ. Tuy nhiên thì cái giá điện này lại còn liên quan đến việc là nếu như chúng ta có sử dụng chạm sạc ở bên ngoài ạ, thì cái chi phí đầu tư cho cái chạm sạc ấy khá là lớn. Có thể là giá điện khi mà chúng ta uh, lại còn phụ thuộc vào các quốc gia ạ. Như ở Việt Nam mình thì chúng ta sử dụng điện nhiều thì sẽ tăng lên. Nhưng hình như ở bên các bạn ấy thì uh, giá điện thì lại sử dụng nhiều thì lại, lại bớt đi đúng không ạ? và bình thường thì thông thường thì cái việc sử dụng cái sạc này thì lại sử dụng ở nhà cho nên là cái chi phí điện này thì không có sự thay đổi nếu chúng ta sử dụng các cái trạm sạc à, các cái 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 sạc ở gia đình ạ. Uh, one more question also related to the electricity price. If there's an hourly electricity tariff For example, in the peak hour or in the off peak hour or normal hour, is there any difference in the electricity price? A difference in the electricity price between the peak hours and the, the lower hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there can be. There can absolutely be a difference in price. Uh, and the, the innovation I talked about with smart charging uh, is actually interesting for this. You can, you can program it so that your car or your bus or your truck will charge uh, when the price is lower. Um, so that's really interesting, and that's also what the uh, the grid company would want. Because uh, if the price is higher, it means that there's a lot of usage of the grid. Uh, it means that the grid quality will go down, uh, or the stability will go down if you use also electricity at that moment. So they want to have it spread out as evenly as possible. Thank you for your answers. Uh, như ông San uh, Cha chia sẻ thì uh, có sự thay đổi, có sự khác biệt khi mà chúng ta sử dụng uh, cái chạm sạc vào những cái giờ cao điểm hoặc là giờ ngoài giờ cao điểm. Thì ở đây thì có nhắc tới cái uh, chạm sạc thông minh. Với cái chạm sạc thông minh này thì chúng ta sẽ có thể là sạc phương tiện uh, vào cái giờ không cao điểm thì có thể sẽ cái chi phí nó sẽ không bị tăng lên ạ. Dạ không biết là anh uh, Hiến có câu hỏi nào không ạ? Có câu hỏi nào không hay là có um, hài lòng với câu trả lời từ ông Sancha ạ? Yes, I think yeah, we have one more questions from the audience. 
uh, can you tell us a bit more about open communication protocols and what are the policies enabled for ensuring that such open standards and protocols are put in place? Yeah, yeah, that's not a question indeed in the in the in the chat as well. Okay, yeah. uh, it's a it's a it's a really good question. Uh, and thanks for that. Um, and I jumped over the open protocols pretty quick, also due to the time difference, uh, the time uh, limitations. Um, not the difference. Um, so the open communication protocols are really important. I hope we got that across. Um, and what you see, for instance, in the in the EU, because that's the examples that I know best, is that there are protocols that are being mandated uh, by regulation, actually. Um, but it's really tricky to do this because uh, you don't want to mandate it too soon and to evict basically other users that don't have this protocol already yet uh, out of the market because then you can also have a, a competition lockout or a, um, a consumer lock-in because there's, there might only be one party that has this protocol already. Um, so it's, it's a really tricky enabler. Uh, uh, absolutely right. And good question, therefore. Um, I'd say that the, the way to go is to... to to work together with the market, but to set one standard uh, of, of usage uh, and set a pathway to this. So that you, you um, basically tell the market, we're going to implement this in a certain amount of years, uh, and then you can keep, keep control while keeping the market uh, satisfied, so to say. I hope that's satisfied as, a, as an answer uh, at this stage, but it's a really difficult, uh, difficult uh, topic and a good question. Yes, thank you. I think that we can uh, understand your answers. And we have one more question for you. The charging technologies change frequently. So if we invest on this kind of technology, charging technologies today, it may soon be uh, outdated. So how will how the country, the developing country, deal with this problem? Yeah. Yeah, uh, also a good question. Yeah, how to, so the question is how to, to manage that your recharging infrastructure won't get outdated in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, that, that's an that's interesting one, but uh, I would have a return question also. Um, like, what is, the, what is the right moment to, to enter uh, a market? You never know when uh, technology reaches a, a certain threshold uh, that is usable for tens of years. Um, so you don't know if, if there might be an innovation in five years uh, that makes all the other recharging infrastructure obsolete and the entire world needs to go to uh, new charging stations. Um, so you never know what the right moment is. Uh, I would say that the recharging infrastructure has matured in such a way that it's unlikely that such a um, real big shift will happen soon. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that, that if you're investing in recharging infrastructure, um that's already uh that's not the newest anymore then it will be outdated sooner than the uh the, the newest recharging infrastructure uh, but keep in mind that of course it's going to be more expensive um so it's, it's a difficult one to manage and then, yeah nobody has a crystal ball uh, to see what's going to happen uh, yes thank you for that uh you know that you said yeah cái công nghệ này thì nó có thể thay đổi 5 năm, năm hoặc là 10 năm thì cũng uh, chúng ta cũng không thể biết trước được và hiện tại thì các quốc gia cũng chưa có cái cái phương án nào tốt nhất cho cái việc xử lý cái việc uh, cái công nghệ nó có thể lạc hậu một cách quá nhanh ạ. Yes. Uh, now we have uh, the next presentations from the Dominic Priors. Dominic Priors had a long career spirit between academic research and teachings and industrial experiences in engineering and urban mobilities. He is an expert in innovative transport modes for logistics and mobilities of goods and passengers. He also managed several national as well as European projects dealing mainly with electromobility and new mobility organization. As, as tôi xin giới thiệu diễn giả tiếp theo là ông Dominic Breer. Ông Dominic Breer thì có kinh nghiệm lâu năm trong việc nghiên cứu và giảng dạy cũng như có kinh nghiệm trong cái lĩnh vực uh, 
trong lĩnh vực về nghiên cứu các vấn đề về kỹ thuật như là giao thông đô thị. Ông là một chuyên gia trong lĩnh vực hậu cần và vận tải. Ông đã quản lý một số các cái dự án quốc gia cũng như là ở châu Âu. Ông Dominic thì sẽ trình bày cho chúng ta phần nội dung liên quan đến việc là tạo môi trường thuận lợi cho các bên liên quan và cái hợp tác giữa các bên. Good morning, good afternoon, Dominic. Uh, we are welcome you to join the session today. And, and uh, I have thus introduced you with the audience from Vietnamese. So uh, now we would like to hear from your experience on the topic of today. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Lanfi, and uh, uh, well, good good afternoon for all of you, and thank you for listening to me. Uh, so, uh, well, you will have the, the translated uh, slides. So, my presentation will deal with the, the uh, well, the, the it's not planned for EV infrastructure, but it's creating well, it's creating enabling environment for stakeholders. So, I will present to you uh, some actions not probably not all actions that could be done but the main actions which i see to which are uh, aiming to enable the participation of the main stakeholders in electromobility well as you've seen before in the sasha presentation some are very important like uh, the utility and uh, the grid operators that are quite important but they are not alone there are also other uh, uh stakeholders and uh that's especially those we are uh, looking for uh using the the electricity at, at the end so if you can have to change the slide go to the next slide thank you so uh my presentation will uh be a bit of three things first we will go on uh, a global view of the electric mobility world, just to remind you who are the, the stakeholders, in fact, because they are very uh, numerous. And we will uh, focus on some uh, possible enabling actions, mainly from the user's point of view and the relations between them and the different stakeholders. Uh, it's a complex network, really, because uh, uh, we try to match uh, different worlds, different worlds. The first, uh time i i experienced such difficulty to 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 have connection between those those was was 10 years ago uh in a big uh, european project which was called green emotion and it was the first time that uh, uh, grid operators and uh, utility produced uh, operators met the uh manufacturers car manufacturers and the authorities and so the rural don't have the same objectives they don't they realize they don't have the same time horizon to uh, make their own strategies for instance car manufacturers were only five years horizon while uh, local authorities have 25 years and uh, utility operators have rather between 15 and 20 years so you have to match all these worlds and if you can change the, the slide please uh yeah next slide there and so uh in this world you have different type of actors which are um, we have not the same objective and the same time horizon and especially if you look at local authorities for instance their main objective is to satisfy citizens well-known and professional demands okay and sometimes to have uh some smart cities and to optimize the public money that's uh typically uh the 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 act of of the uh, mobility in cities and also you're the user as well in that way it's more the individual users but if you are your your time horizon is rather real time uh a very short term horizon and you have the professionals where uh, the 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 main objective is more or less profitability in in any way uh you can think and there are different types of uh professionals so on the next slide thank you just click yes first you have the users then the main stakeholders if i want if i uh, if i can say that because they're the really the 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 one who will use the electromobility and then you have different types you have the of course the uh, individuals you and me going to work or going uh, uh, traveling for leisure and so on 
and you have also operators for passengers and goods. You have also the operators in parking as well, which are used because they implement these, uh, these, station, these charging stations. And you have also the, uh, some service providers, especially in the mobility as a service domain, which deliver apps. And uh, Sasha told about some of them uh, when uh, for, for supporting charging. And you have also the enterprises, some enterprises, which are uh, involved in the domain because sometimes, and we will come back and uh, Sasha also told that, uh, they, they can have charging station in their uh, premises. Then you have also, just click the, the second tab, you have local authorities. And local authorities have two, uh, well, two ways or, or two types of, of uh, participation. First, they are the regulating uh, authorities and the mobility department are the organizers of the mobility of the uh, world. And you have also at the global, national, and re regional level some strategies. But they are also users because they have a fleet and they, they manage the transport, uh, or sometimes they directly manage the buses and so on. So they are on both way. And on the other hand, if you click again, you have all the, uh, all the, the, you know, the, the energy suppliers, the electric suppliers, and uh, they are connecting, of course, through the charging station uh, operators, which manage or inst install and then manage the uh, charging stations. And as Sasha said before, you have all the links between the production uh, distribution of uh, electricity, which is also uh, another world, because uh, with the decentralization of the production of energy of type of this renewable energies, you can have different configuration uh, for the delivery of the energy. If you look, for instance, for instance in some emerging countries where you have uh, direct solar uh, production or electricity production, you can have really local, uh, decentralized energy uh, production, which can feed some charging stations through batteries, st storage, and so on. So it's, it's a world. It's, so you have to manage this world. And if you click again, you have the last type of uh, stakeholders, which are in line also because that they have to, to, to be involved in this, in this process or, or in the dialogues. You have the vehicle manufacturers, of course, uh, first because they, they produce the vehicles. And uh, if we talk of cars and trucks, of course, big companies, normally sometimes big companies, but in, in the case, for instance, of Vietnam, you have a lot of uh, small uh, manufacturers of motorcycles, e-bikes, e-motorcycles, which can, which must be involved and which have to be involved in, in, in the process. And for the maintenance as well, when you talk about recycling batteries and so on. So uh, they have to be uh, involved in the process. And you have the civil engineering companies as well, and all are the, 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 the companies which has to be um, uh, well in, involved in the process because as when you have uh, to, to build or to install uh, uh, charging stations, for instance, uh, you need to have them uh, around. You have also on the other side, the, the banks and the insurances because it's not maybe at the local level, but in global, you have uh, specific, for instance, uh, for insurance for 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 electric vehicles, or you have the banks and other funding organizations which which have to be involved because they can help funding or supporting the installations, and of course you have the urbanists, the architects, all the people who are in charge of the future of the city, which have to think about how to uh, make a city better or at least uh, using uh, electromobility. Uh, as a way of, of the mode of transport. So all these uh, companies, people, and, and organisms have to be uh, or must be considered as stakeholders. So if we go in more detail, next sl slide, please. Uh, 
uh, before going in the enabling actions, you also must consider uh, uh, there's some relativity, uh, rel relativity and adaptability of the possible of the actions which are possible. First. You must consider that there are several levels. I will talk in this speech mainly about local level, what is possible at local level. But of course, there are some actions which need to be um, decided at national or, or regional level, such as uh, tax incentives or, or advance uh, for tax rebates or, or reg registration rebates, things like that must be done at uh, national level, for instance, we have in France and in other, this, it is in other countries a uh, specific program uh, when you, where you get incentives when you uh, give back your old vehicle and you, you have some incentive to buy electric vehicle. That's possible. You have also uh, uh, some money that can be done by what are called individuals, which are more or less uh, companies or small companies who can have uh, some local actions or global actions when uh, companies make special offers, for instance, uh, car manufacturers or bike manuf motorcycle manufacturers make special offers to, uh, to foster the deployment of electric vehicles. You also uh, must design uh, uh, the, 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 well, your, 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 your uh, mobility uh, policy, uh, electromobility policy, according to uh, stakeholder needs. Uh, otherwise, that could be a big failure. For instance, we had some years ago, uh, there's a lot of, uh, well, uh, rush in France about putting everywhere, uh, but that was a political uh, trend, to uh, charging things everywhere in, in, for the, uh, on the public domain. Uh, that was, uh, well, some five, six years ago. And then you had a lot of uh, very nice charging stations, always empty, <laughs> with nobody charging, because first, there was not so many vehicles, then they were not at the right place. And where or, or you had people who are just uh, parking their cars, for uh, many, many hours blocking the station. So, uh, and that was, and this is still a big failure. Okay, so, and you have also to, 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 to consider the, the culture, the ways of, of uh, uh, managing a country, for instance, and, it's in, and your, uh, the way you involve stakeholders is ob obviously different according to the countries and the, the the actions to, you have to enable uh, you care for enabling the uh, the the environment is different. For instance, if you look at the uh, the Norwegian case, Norwegian case, for instance, where uh, there's a lot of uh, rebate on taxes uh, for the vehicles, or at least there's no uh, taxes on. Uh, well, there were no taxes on electric vehicles. Well, uh, and on the contrary, there are big taxes on uh, ICE vehicles. Okay, that's because Norwegian, uh, uh, Norwegian country and Norwegian authorities uh, can earn a lot of have a lot of money. That's possible to do that from uh, <laughs> partially from the the, the the sale of the petrol they have in the North Sea. So uh, it's quite different, and you have to think first what is the best for your country and for the stakeholders of your country, which is, uh, and you have to, to think about this. If you change the slide, please, uh, you have to uh, determine what motivates each type of stakeholders. Uh, the, the costs first, that's always the cost, the costs, either purchase cost, exploitation, maintenance costs, and so on. You have the commercial aspect, if the users are professional. So if sales, how, you, how many sales uh, you, you can have, what is the image you can uh, give? And of course, you have the uh, utilization. Is it easy to, to use the cars or, or the, the, the vehicles? Are they reliable? Is it secure? Do you have any service around? And so on and so on. So. So uh, 
you have to think first on what is the motivation of each stakeholders. And of course, since the motivations are different to the stakeholders, uh, you have to balance uh, the enabling actions between them, between the stakeholders, because uh, what is positive for one is negative for the other one. So you have to, uh, well, either to force uh, the people using uh, the, the what you decide, either you have to uh, try, and, uh, try to find cooperation or collaboration between them. So now uh, that I've set up the, 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 the global view, just go in more details about the, the different stakeholders. So if we go first and the next slide uh, on the uh, individuals, I mean the, the, the users you are uh, of everybody, uh, uh, people, uh, uh, any people, uh, just remind me that if you were uh, yesterday uh, during my talk, uh, maybe you, uh, you remember that I told you about the top-down and bottom-up strategies. And this is more for the bottom-up strategies, okay? But the first thing is what they, they want is the, uh, want to be reassured is the implementation or, or the availability of energy. So uh, the first is, the, the first concern, the first, what, what enables uh, their participation to, to this process is to be sure or reassure about the availability of energy. Can I charge my uh, vehicle? So uh, you can implement charging station everywhere on street, new buildings and so on, renovation. You have to facilitate to use, to, to, to have charging stations at work and you have also to facilitate the interoperability facilities, as Sasha mentioned uh, previously. And uh, uh, also costing, mean, we talk about that, but if we go more in detail in the next slide, please. Thank you. Now, uh, just si sli this slide, just to show you the, uh, well, the links between the various stakeholders on the different uh, aspects when you want to facilitate charging. When you want to facilitate charging, you need to have the visibility and to put it at the right place. To do that, you need to work with urban planners, charging operators, utility uh, providers, civil engineering, and enterprises uh, for the private localization when they have to. Uh, well, and it's complex. And of course, you have also to, to discuss with uh, sometimes with the municipality and the people I'm involved in, in, in such uh, a decision because uh, I work for, for an assembling committee for that in my own uh, urban community. And uh, it's very complicated to have a uh, a good approach where to put the stations, for instance, because you have several considerations to, uh, we have the technical ones. Do you have enough electricity, enough power in that place? Do you have a flow, an enough flow of people going by or passing by? And uh, do you have uh, the, 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 the attractive points nearby and so on and so on. So, it's not so easy to first define what is the best place which will uh, facilitate the use of uh, your charging stations. So this, and, and this is quite important because that's what enables the users to use these stations. Then the interoperability as uh, Sasha said before, but this involves a lot of people, the, the charging manufacturers, the operators, the vehicle manufacturers, because the interoperability is not only uh, for the payment and the fact that you can use it everywhere, but it is also inside the car, if you have the good charger or the good uh, software to charge and so on. So you have all the people uh, in the vehicle manufacturing, of course, you have the tarification aspect. There was one question about that, uh, but this is also very important. So you have to define as a municipality with the DSOs, with the charging operators, what is uh, the tarification. You have 
also to discuss, and this is related to the, to the reachability or the accessibility, the physical accessibility to the station. So where to find a, a, a charging station available, not uh, broken uh, or, or out of order. So you have to discuss with the developers of uh, specific apps and of course the charging stations uh, operators to have connected stations for instance and also you have the facility to use it uh, to have the right plug you have you have since you have also different type of uh, uh, for the time being different type of plugs you need to have all the the the, the standards of plugs and so on and so on so you see uh, you see that uh, the, the the involvement uh, well to enable the users uh, the drivers, you and me, to use uh, these uh, charging stations or, or to use electric vehicles, uh, you have to do that. And either you have this at home, as I said before, or on uh, public or private domain. Well, the questions are almost the same. Uh, it's a bit different, but they are almost the same. So uh, this is for, for, for each of these questions, you have to uh, discuss with the different stakeholders to, uh, to have a cooperation, collaboration to find the best solutions. Then you can click once more, normally, yes. And that was just a, a short remark, but uh, uh, on the well, I mean, on the public domain or, pri uh, or open domain, uh, yes, you need to have powerful charging stations only because uh, we still have some debates. Well, at least in France, but in, in other countries, where to how what is the power of the charging stations? But if somebody asked before, uh, you you want to have uh, well stations which are not obsolete in the the coming years you need to have powerful stations because the the, the cars will have uh, more uh, more power in the battery pack uh, it's a bit different of course if you look if you talking about uh, e-bikes or e-motorcycles uh, which require less power but uh, it's it's another point because if uh, i didn't but if you look at uh, I told you before, if you look at the uh, battery swapping problem for motorbikes, for instance, you need to have really uh, a dialogue between the different uh, uh, manufacturers uh, of batteries and of motorbikes uh, in order to have uh, interchangeable uh, batteries. It's a problem, in that way, so you need to have relationships between these uh, stakeholders. If you go uh, next slide, yes, it was just, uh, and I won't do that for all because it would take a long time, but uh, it's the same when you want to, to, to decrease the, the, the purchase cost, for instance. You have the incentive first, of course. Uh, and then you have to convince funding organizations to for for to have the the, the money for that and to do these uh, incentives to towards your uh, uh, users or citizens. If you are at look, I'm still looking at local level, of course, because as I told before, it's a bit different when you are at national level, uh, level where you can have uh, other actions. But, and you could also uh, work uh, the product side and uh, on the local manufacturers, the startups. I'm mainly in the case of uh, light vehicles, like, uh, well, light, really light four wheels, but otherwise two or three wheelers, for instance, where you have a lot of local manufacturers, startups, and so on. So uh, you can work with them uh, to help them, to, to, to push them to, to, to go on the market, to find incubator, incubators, for instance, and so, for instance, and so on. But you have also to work with them and the people with the uh, manufacturers of charging station about the protocols, about the equipment, where to put them. You have to, to work with the batteries uh, suppliers and producers 
So all these have to work together in order to find out the best way to, to have cheapest uh, vehicles. And you have also the, the, the possibilities to, to retrofit them at more cars, uh, but it's also a possibility. And then it's more with local uh, garages or mechanics that you can work, which also have to work with uh, the, the designers of batteries mainly and other uh, electric components or, or, or electric motorization components. So this is another uh, way, uh, or, or you see that the, 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 the stakeholders are more or less the same, not always the same. It depends on what are your actions. But of course, you see that always you find the uh, charging stations, manufacturers or, uh, or, or operators, they are not very far from the discussions. Then uh, we can uh, go on the next slide, please. And I will go uh, quickly on, uh, on the rest because I see that the time is going on. Uh, just click again because uh, I have some. Uh, so you can have a tra traffic adventure. That's uh, first the uh, for the well for the city or local authorities to decide. And you you have also and views on uh, low emission zones, which are uh, a way to to make or to push the use of uh, of electric vehicles and all access authorizations. You could have dedicated parking or dedicated lines and so on. And uh, Sasha talked about the, these uh, parking places for uh, electric vehicles. And you have also, the, as I told before, uh, for instance, for different services, like the deployment of e-electric apps. We talked a bit about that uh, concept yesterday. But in that case, you have to involve charging operators, utilities. You have uh, uh, the private sector for a local action, to put it, uh, what kind of activities, who is going to own the place, and so on. So it's another uh, type of relationship that you have with all stakeholders. And uh, I would just, uh, you can also organize joint procur procurement uh, for uh, small companies, for instance, who want to be electric, who want to have electric vehicles. You can, have, you can do that. It's a way to enable uh, the, the, the development. And you have also to work on the intermodality inside your own transport system, providing, for instance, uh, bike e-bikes or e-motorcycles at the main stations, uh, bus stations, BRT stations, or, or roads, or rail stations. So these are only for individuals. What is possible then? We can go quickly through the others. Uh, please change, OK? Yes, and I will stop after that. But uh, for fleet owners, it's also you You can work also, of course, with the fleet owners, which are uh, uh, that's more the uh, the top down approach as told yesterday. You have almost the same uh, actions to enable as previously for individuals, but you have some more. Uh, for instance, to, 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 to help them to install charging stations or depots, uh, to find out and to, to involve the people there uh, for uh, at depots. Uh, you, you also have uh, uh, different ways. For instance, uh, you can have some uh, charging stations reserved uh, for, for, for the professionals. That has been done in many cities. Uh, to, to have a specific charging stations or, or time uh, reserved for uh, professionals, uh, as a fixed hours or uh, on uh, on call, you can call and have the the, the, the charging station reserved for you. For instance, uh, you have also the ways to organize the the the, the, the traffic. For instance. To, to, to give access to airports uh, only to uh, electric taxis or to stations. This is already done in some countries, uh, even in emerging countries. 
but you have also for deliveries, you have also for time, uh, time deliveries, for instance, uh, the night delivery, which are uh, used, uh, which use only electric vehicles or electric vans, uh, for instance, it's another way to help uh, the deployment of uh, electric mobility in uh, companies with uh, uh, with existing companies and you have also another way which is used is it, which is used is the replacement of the vehicles it's it's done in uh, mainly for informal transport and in some african countries it's done and uh where, where there is a lot of uh, informal transport and the, the vehicles are well are bought by the the the, the, the managers of the fleet uh, and the uh, authority uh, just uh, pay for the <coughs> the difference of price between ice normal ice vehicle and uh, the electric vehicle. So this difference uh, is paid by, uh, by by the local authorities. So it's a way to enable uh, the, the 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 fleet owners to to access uh, the electric mobility. And of course, you can work on the uh, different services, uh, mainly on, on training the drivers, the operators, the maintenance. This can be done also by the municipality. This can be organized by the municipalities, for instance, to have uh, or, or to help, for instance, to to when you have in some cities you have uh, bus com on companies, bus companies, for instance, you have simulators for buses, uh, bus driving, okay, to, to train uh, the drivers, then you can also have uh, simulators for electric buses driving, for instance, it's another way to, and you can uh, push people to develop such uh, software. So you see there are a lot of enabling actions that can be done on the most concerned users, which are uh, the, the, the people who drive every day on the road, uh, and they, they, to help them to change to to turn to electromobility. Then on other stakeholders, if you can change the slides, uh, yes, I talk, just go on because I talk already of that. Uh, so for service providers, I will just talk about uh, vehicle sharing, for instance. Uh, for vehicle sharing, uh, you can have only uh, you can ask for uh, to have only electric vehicles, which is done already uh, for vehicle sharing. So you can allow uh, the, the the space for uh, for to do this vehicle sharing uh, or the license uh, just for uh, people who, sh who are sharing electric vehicles. You can also help them in uh, using uh, for that's for uh, two wheelers of course actually two wheel. but you have uh, car sharing stations you have to balance car sharing stations to where uh, you know to 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 equilibrate to to the the, the number of uh, bikes or, or motorcycles scooters uh, on the stations you can have uh, you can Allow uh, to to the people who are transferring the these uh, these two wheelers bikes uh, to use the bus lane or, for instance, the dedicated dedicated lanes, because for them it's quicker to do that rather than being uh, uh, in the congestion or, or, or of the difficulties of the traffic. Then you can have also uh, uh, other actions if you change. The slide you can have also action for the enterprises uh first we told that of that before but to facilitate the inclusion of charging stations at work and you can see uh, on the right side uh some uh, guidelines to do that with the managers of these uh, companies but you can organize transport uh, of the employees by e-buses or, or, or again, uh, I would say um, help or support the enterprises to, to buy e buses uh, for the transport of their employees. And you can also have uh, it's another way, but 
uh, when the, the municipality is making tenders, you can have in the criteria some bonus for the suppliers which are using EVs. This also another action to enable uh, the, the use of electric vehicles. Then uh, to finish the next slide, and I will finish on that, uh, come back to the national uh, level, sometimes regional level. Uh, there are a lot of actions also that can be done, and but the most, the, the main ones are first the, to have standard protocols for all EV technologies. This can't be done at local level, of course, but uh, but it's some of the uh, most important uh, actions uh, that has to be uh, set up. And then you have also, uh, but Sasha told about that before, the dynamic management of EV chargers and the smart charging uh, facilities, which has to be at national level. And uh, also, the, as it is, it is done in some countries, in uh, sometimes uh, there are something also a bit like uh, that at a uh, European level, but it's more at a country level to have uh, the open data system uh, and to oblige uh, that, the in, that all charging stations which are implemented are uh, connected or can have uh, an open data uh, process in order to facilitate the connections between uh, the station to and to uh, well to use only one uh, subscription to uh, charge in all stations of your country. It's done at regional level. For instance, in Aquitaine, New Aquitaine, where I live, it's done that uh, all stations which are implemented, you have the same uh, card. Uh, or once you have subscribing subscribed in one uh, company which are managing the staging charging stations, then uh, it's interoperable, interoperable with other uh, stations of other companies in uh, in Jan, which is a large region, well, probably the largest in France. Okay, so I will stop there and we'll, uh, and I welcome all your questions. Uh, thank you, oh sorry, <laughs> uh, and thank you for listening to me and uh, well, if you have questions, don't hesitate. Yeah, thank you, Peter Dominic, for the presentation. It provides us a cross view overview of uh, electromobilities world with all the stakeholders and the relevant issues. I think that there are also many enabling actions for different stakeholders that we can apply to the Vietnam context. Thank you for the, your presentation. And now we are welcome question from the audience. À, như vậy là ông Dominic đã kết thúc phần trình bày của mình ạ. Nếu các anh chị có câu hỏi thì có thể cho lên phần chat box để chúng ta có thể trao đổi cùng diễn giả. Ở đây thì em, đây thì tôi đã nhìn thấy một câu hỏi rồi ạ. Thì xin phép sẽ dịch câu hỏi đó cho uh, diễn giả. Từ anh uh, Đức ạ. Uh, technically, I said, please, is the charging station located? Uh, I mean, we have one question from the audience. Uh, he want to ask about whether the charging station can locate it at or near the petrol station, because in the next maybe 20s or 30s years or longer, Vietnam will still have uh, the electric vehicle and uh, ice vehicle. At the same time, so in that condition, uh, we will won't have enough space for the charging station. So if that's okay, if we have the same place for the petrol station and the uh, electricity charging station. Well, it is not a problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> to have them both and uh, it's starting to develop in many countries for instance in the highways on the highways you can find uh, well normal stations every 40 50 kilometers for instance and you have also uh, uh, charging stations powerful ones 
uh, because it's on the highway. So it's at least 50 kilowatts uh, for the time being. But it will be the, the, the future of, of all charging stations because uh, you need a lot of power to go uh, further on. But it's really, it's totally possible. And some companies, for instance, some uh, companies which features, which manufactures uh, petrol uh, fueling station, big ones, are also now producing uh, electric charging stations. The same company are uh, manufacturing both. I know them, but the, the main ones in France are, are, are doing that. And you uh, because uh, and the advantage is that they have already all the interoperability systems because the difference is that you can pay directly with your uh, bank card and not with a specific card. So that's most that's very important. Yeah, thank you for that. À, như ông Dominic có trả lời thì cái việc mà chúng ta có thể để chạm sạc xe điện và chạm sạc à, à, chạm à, xăng dầu bình thường ở cùng một địa điểm là hoàn toàn có thể và rất là nhiều nước thì hiện tại vẫn đang thực hiện theo cái hướng đó đặc biệt là ở Pháp thì các cái công ty mà vận hành các cái chạm xăng dầu thì có thể vận hành luôn cả các cái chạm sạc xe điện ạ Đấy là câu trả lời đến từ ông Dominic Thank you, Dominic. I have just translated your answer to the mm -hmm. audience. Good. And he uh, would, like to, uh, he would like to say thank to your answers. Thank you. Nếu các anh chị có câu hỏi nào khác nữa không ạ? Thì chúng ta sẽ cùng trao đổi luôn với bác Dominic ạ. I think that we <laughs> we have one more. À, cảm ơn anh Đức ạ. Ban tổ chức đã nhận được câu hỏi của anh ạ. Bây giờ sẽ uh, cùng uh, nói trao đổi với diễn giả. Uh, in the country that uh, in the country that have the developed electric vehicle system like in France, in your countries, is the network of charging station blended and operated by the government or by private enterprises? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not by the government, that's true. That's sure, it's not the government. But uh, at the beginning, it was uh, managed by uh, local authorities mainly, mm. okay? And well, they, they have a specific well de delegation of public services okay but they were at the uh, at the launch of the, the the process that was the local authorities and they delegated the uh, operational side but now it's more or less private and there are a lot of companies which are well there are sometimes semi-public companies because they are or, or, or they belong to uh there are subsidiaries for instance of edf which is the company of uh, uh, the, the, the supplying the electricity in France. But that you have also a lot of small companies which are delivering, uh, which are managing the uh, charging stations, private ones. Yes, yeah, small ones with some of, uh, well, I was talking about uh, New Aquitaine, my region uh, in France, but there are five or six companies today uh, managing uh, charging stations all over the region. They are interoperable, of course, and they have between, uh, for one, it's, I think it's 150 stations, and the new one, new west, new west one is only 20 stations for the time being, but it, it is applying for new tenders. So there are many different uh, enterprises that are many of the charging station in France. Some can manage um, the number of uh, charging station up to 2000 and some only 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not thousands, not thousands yet. Well, not, well, maybe in France, but I was talking about my, my region. It's the biggest uh -huh. one I think is only 150. I may, uh, I may yeah, yeah. 150. Yeah. Between 150 and 200. Yeah, yeah. Uh, như ông Dominic có chia sẻ thì 
à, ban đầu ấy, cái việc khởi tạo các cái trạm sạc ở Pháp thì do chính quyền địa phương quản lý nhưng mà hiện nay thì các uh, doanh nghiệp tư nhân thì um, đang quản lý các cái trạm sạc này có những cái doanh nghiệp lớn họ sẽ quản lý số lượng lớn có doanh nghiệp nhỏ hơn thì sẽ quản lý số lượng nhỏ hơn ạ thế là uh, chia sẻ từ phía ông Dominic ạ không biết anh ấy có câu hỏi nào khác không ạ Oh, nice. uh, I think that's me to do. You are satisfied with your answers. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. So other question we can discuss on the Q&A session after work. And thank you, Mr. Dominic, for joining us today and giving the presentation. Thank you. And you can send me the questions by mail because maybe I will have to leave you before the Q&A stations. So yes. don't hesitate to send me the, the, the questions by mail and then I will answer. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you, bye. À, vì ông Dominic thì sẽ không thể ở lại tham dự là phần Q&A section của chúng ta cho nên là các câu hỏi nếu có thì sẽ được chuyển tới ông Dominic à, qua email ạ. À, Kathleen, do you have me to share the slide? Ở phần tiếp theo thì chúng ta sẽ đến với những uh, cây example, những cái uh, bài học kinh nghiệm tới từ các quốc gia châu Á và các quốc gia phát triển và sẽ được bắt đầu với diễn giả Sergio Fernandez ạ. Ông uh, Sergio Fernandez là giám, ốc, giám đốc dự án quốc tế về quan hệ thể chế thuộc công ty vận tải của thành phố Madrid, Tây Ban Nha. À, ở thành phố này thì ông hiện đang là lãnh đạo cho các cái dự án nghiên cứu và đổi mới cũng như là cung cấp hỗ trợ kỹ thuật trực tiếp cho hội đồng thành phố. Lĩnh vực làm việc của ông thì tập trung vào à, giao thông bền vững trong đô thị, đặc biệt là chú trọng đến à, à, giao thông vận tải và sử dụng phương tiện bằng điện đối với các dự án quốc tế. Ạ. Uh, welcome, Mr. Sergio Fernandez. I have just introduced uh, your bio to the Vietnamese audience. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, uh, now you are, are welcome to give the to deliver the presentation on the deployment of Madrid charging infrastructures. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, so in the following slides, I will uh, introduce you the different strategies that the city of Madrid and EMT Madrid have uh, uh, settled uh, to deploy charging infrastructure for private vehicles. That, so that is uh, focusing on, on private vehicles, not on buses. However, I will be glad to share that information from our own point of view as a public transport operator in any upcoming training sessions. But right now, the next slides will focus on, on this uh, charging infrastructure. So first of all, EMT Madrid, the company I work for is the public transport operator of the city. It was created in 1947 and we are fully owned by Madrid City Council. We provide the service all year round and we managed the public bus uh, urban network in the city, but we also provide other public mobility services, such as managing parking facilities, both for uh, visitors and residents, providing charging infrastructure in these parking facilities, the toll tracks, the cranes for parking enforcement. Also, since uh, September 2016, we manage the public e-bike sharing system, Bithimar, with this, which is also fully formed by Pedalex, electric bikes. And uh, since January 2018, we also manage the cable car of the system. Despite all those services, we manage also the segregated bus lanes, the publicity at the bus uh, stops, and, and also we provide consultancy services. Next slide, please. So um, our strategy as a public transport operator is fully aligned with uh, the one from Madrid City Council. We have a strategic plan up to 2025, uh, and it's aligned with this new sustainability strategy of the city of Madrid, which is called Madrid 360. 
is a strategy that combines air quality and climate change. And uh, one of the most important objectives is, is to make ourselves a green and sustainable company. And that includes as well electrification. Next slide, please. Okay, so from the city, specifically talking about the city, uh, there is a general directorate that manages and coordinates all the different initiatives regarding electric mobility. Um, is the sustainable and environmental control general directorate, and they are in charge of this uh, strategy, Madrid 360. They are also developing, um, it was recently approved, uh, the new sustainable mobility ordinance that also pushes very strongly electric mobility. And they are expected to approve as well a new sustainable urban mobility plan this year, later this year. And those strategic documents covers every single aspect related to electric mobility. Next. So um, now we will get into the topic specifically. Um, I must say that initially uh, the city uh, decided to start working on setting a public charging uh, network on, 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 on street one in, in public roads back in 2009. It was a pilot project. And after several years, we realized that it was really difficult to work on uh, public charging in, in public works, uh, in public areas, I'm sorry, in, 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 in on a street parking, because there is always a lot of complications in terms of public works. There is always problems with vandalism. There is always problems, legal problems on the ownership of the, of the streets, of the pole, of the uh, different infrastructure. Uh, there is always some uh, uh, problems with uh, citizens and users because uh, public work is really demanded. So whenever you allocate uh, public space for charging, it is actually a private, a private operation. So allocating public space for a private operation, it's always a tricky thing. So uh, the city decided not to bet for uh, uh, setting public uh, poles in, uh, in public space. And we opted to push uh, uh, charging points off a street. So that means out of public. Uh, of the public space. And this, uh, this is the reason for, for which in Madrid there are only 24 on the street uh, fast charging stations in the car side, so you can find them on the street. These ones initially were a standard uh, charging points, so charging a very low power, like three kilowatts up to maybe six kilowatts, but today they have been all upgraded to fast charging. Uh, this way, they provide some sort of added value, which makes them attractive for private operators to manage that network. And this way also, we keep uh, the vehicles less time parked on, uh, on street. So there are only 24, which are uh, managed by uh, two different private operators. Um, and, um, and then we have an additional number of 38 fast charging stations located off a street. That means they have free access, but they are located on private land, either petrol stations, parking facilities, municipal markets, or commercial centers. So in total, we have 62. Uh, and this is the, the idea how the city is now approaching this. So um, having especially fast charging, uh, for opportunity charging, and then standard charging for overnight charging. Uh, next slide, please. So regarding uh, this curbside network, the, the on-street network, as I mentioned, there are only 24 parking uh, charging uh, poles. They are managed since uh, 2014 via a public-private partnership agreement among the Madrid City Council, which is the owner of the network, uh, and, uh, and the supplier of the fast chargers. And, and it's also the manager of the parking base. Um, and then two private companies, which are specialized in charging solutions. And they take care of the customer service, the payment management, the, the, the app uh, to, for all the process, also the repairing and maintenance works, and also the grid connection works. 
So this, uh, this is based on an agreement and we expect to renew it uh, next year up to 2025. Uh, this way, the city council uh, pushes this private public cooperation. Uh, and uh, it is relevant to mention and to point out that the, the charging points are, are purchased by the city. So the initial investment is done by the city. And then the city, let's say, borrows uh, the charging points to these private companies and they take care of all the uh, maintenance. Um, and also, it's also a way to, to push the private sector to get involved because generally, uh, when you start developing a business like this one, uh, you, have, uh, you want to reduce the initial um, investment costs uh, because you don't know how the business will work. Uh, so this way, we, we removed the initial, let's say, concerns of these private operators. That's the, the, that you can see down there the customer price and also the average charging process, which is just 10 kilowatts uh, per hour. And the maximum charging point when you are on a street is one hour and it's free parking. So it's also a way to promote it. They don't have to pay for the parking because in Madrid, uh, all the on street space for parking is a payment one. So uh, within the, the first ring of the city, you have to pay for leaving your car in the street. And the main goal is how to gather more knowledge and then decide a new approach for the management of this public on a street network after 2025. Next slide, please. So the second approach uh, for, for developing this uh, charging network is deploying charging facilities in private facilities, in private land, but with free access. Um, so again, in this case, the Madrid City Council, the municipality, assumes the role of the fast charger equipment supplier. So the City Council launches public tenders to purchase fast chargers. In this case, uh, up to 2020, um, the city has procured 105 smart fast chargers. And then um, they, uh, the city council offers these fast chargers to uh, private landowners to install them and to manage them up to for a period of eight years. So it can be four years capable to be extended or able to be extended for four more years. Um, the city is now working on a new tender to be finished uh, by the end of this year with 53 additional fast chargers, uh, including seven ultra fast uh, chargers up to 150 kilowatts. So uh, this way, uh, we also try to remove these initial uh, concerns of uh, private landowners on making the, the initial investment. And, um, and also this way we will deploy fast charging infrastructures through the 21 uh, districts of the city, fostering this private market for, for charging solutions. Um, it's, it's, it's also under this scope of private public cooperation uh, because the city uh, really doesn't want to become a charging provider. It's not within our duties. Uh, we need to facilitate the deployment of this alternative fuel network, let's say, but uh, the city doesn't want to become a, 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 a charging provider by its own. Next slide, please. Then uh, another approach that the city is doing is to focus on a specific uh, sectors, such as uh, freight, urban freight, and also professional fleets. Why? Well, because um, they have a lot of visibility. So it's something that it's, 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 uh, everybody sees in the city uh, uh, every single day. They, they, they have also, they represent a very high percentage of the daily uh, movements in the city. Uh, and it's also a way of introducing electric mobility uh, in, in sectors which are fundamental for the city functioning. So um, uh, you, uh, using advantage, advantage of taking advantage of the National Plan of Recovery, Transformation and Resilience funded by the European Union, 
uh, after the pandemic, uh, uh, we uh, have the aim of building 12 electric mobility e-hubs that will offer fast solutions, ultra fast uh, solutions up to 150 kilowatts, also hydrogen supply, and also with a photovoltaic generation solar plant. And these will be uh, located in industrial areas at the south and east of the city where most of the logistic operations take place because it's the most active area in the city in terms of logistics. And uh, the city will offer public land so private uh, operators can operate and build these sort of e-hubs under a regime of public concession. So uh, in total, there will be 12 um, supply stations and the city is starting at the moment with all the, the legal uh, procedure to, to launch this. Next slide, please. Then I would like to focus on, on EMT Madrid and the charging infrastructure we manage. As I mentioned, we are the public transport operator of the city and one of our services is to manage charging facilities in different parking locations. We have up to 25 parking facilities with more than 11,000 parking lots. And uh, right now we are installing uh, charging infrastructure uh, following the indications of the law. Uh, in Spain, in Madrid, the law says that there must be one charging point every 14 uh, parking lots. So we are installing these parking, uh, these charging facilities, uh, focusing on private users, the users that uh, use our parking facilities. And uh, we have uh, uh, in total uh, seven fast chargers up to 50 kilowatts that allows an average charging of 33 minutes to get a almost full charging. Then um, semi-fast uh, charging, we have 16 charging points. Uh, so that means uh, that it allows you to charge, totally charge around in around four hours. And then we have also standard chargers between three and 7.5 kilowatts hour. And for those uh, we have 92 which are actually free of charge. So we only, uh, you have only to pay as a user if you use the semi-fast and the fast chargers. But if you want to use the standard ones, low, char uh, low speed chargers, those are free of charge. Next slide, please. So these are some pictures on how they look like in different parkings at the right-hand side. You have the low, the standard charging, free of charge and then on the other pictures you have some of the fast and semi-fast chargers which are uh, you have to pay for for them and they are all located in areas where there is surveillance and uh, in controlled environments let's say either parkings or areas close to our uh, facilities next slide please the management uh, all the charging process is managed via an app this app has been developed by us and now it's being integrated within our mobility as a service platform. The idea is to have all the different services of EMT fully integrated, allowing a single interface for all the users. So now this is the way you use it and you even uh, unlock the, the charger and you pay by using the app. So there is no need of interaction between the, the user and the totem, the, the pole that you just need to take the, the wire and plug it, and uh, then all the process is done via the app. Next slide, please. These are the fees we apply. The fees are different depending on uh, where the parking pole is located. So if it's within a parking facilities, uh, 35 cents, uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour. If it is in Cologne Square, which is an uh, let's say an area of free access where we have uh, more charging points, uh, it's uh, 40 cents per uh, the euro cents per kilowatt hour. And why is this? Because when you enter um, parking, you have to pay for the parking fee as well. So that's why we reduce the price for those charging points at the parking facilities. Otherwise, if you don't have to get into a parking, then it's it's a slightly more expensive, but you don't have to pay for parking. And in some special weeks or periods of the, of the year, we also provide special fees 
like uh, the electric week we call it or during the uh, European mobility week etc next slide please so just getting to an end some outcomes uh, according to our own experience uh, public private cooperation is key can be really an interesting tool um, in the earlier phases when you want to deploy charging solutions because it allows you to reduce your investment it also allows to uh, gather more knowledge and experience uh, it's a learning process to all the parts involved all the time um, and it can also create the conditions for a private market but it's very important very important to take into account the local context uh, and to have local allies for instance here in madrid the taxi sector was a very important ally because it has a lot of visibility and everybody is aware that whenever a taxi driver um, opts for a specific car model or technology, it's because it's, it's absolutely tested, because it's profitable for them. And that also generates a lot of confidence. So maybe for the Vietnamese example, it would be interesting to have local allies. I don't know if the motorcycle sector, I know that in, in Hanoi, in Ho Chi Minh City, there are plenty, plenty of motorbikes. Maybe something uh, with the motorbikes can also create a, a favorable local context for electric motorbikes or different sectors uh, that uh, are very visible in the city. It is also very important to have a proper communication, to, to have a very fluent communication with the user, communicating any incidents, but also communicating the advantages of shifting towards electric mobility. Um, and it's also very important to have a political support. Whenever you have political support, all the different obstacles can be more easily overcome. Uh, overcome. And, and um, it's, it's very important to have this commitment from, from politicians uh, in order to, to push uh, electrification. So I think this is my last slide. Oh, I forgot to make my contact details. I apologize for that. Uh, I, will I will provide to Kathleen and the rest of the people from Clean Air Asia uh, my, my contact details in case you need to contact me for further information. And uh, I will be glad to answer any question if there is any. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Smita Shekios, for the insightful presentation. Uh, uh, it provides us a uh, the public private partnership models uh, in EMT companies in your company in Madrid, as you said, with uh, your good example for Hanoi City. Uh, it is really impressive to see how EMT has managed and developed the city charges infrastructure, the fleets, and other transport services. The recommendation from your experiences is really valuable for us. I think that in Hanoi now, we also conducting the demo uh, on uh, selling to electric, electric to weather as a last mile connectivity. So we think that it's great to have the support on the demos in the near future, especially in sharing experiences. You know? Yeah. So now we are welcome the audience to uh, have questions. Uh, Xin cảm ơn ông Sergio đã có một cái phần trình bày rất là ấn tượng đối với một cái mô hình hợp tác công tư trong việc quản lý các trạm sạc cũng như các dịch vụ giao thông. Các anh chị trong buổi học thì có câu hỏi nào thì chúng ta có thể cho lên phần chat box để chúng ta giao lưu cùng diễn giả luôn ạ. Như chúng ta đã thấy thì đây là một cái mô hình ạ. À, công ty quản lý các trạm sạc cũng như là các dịch vụ giao thông và công ty thì có 100% cái uh, vốn của thành phố đây là một cái mô hình rất là mới ạ và rất là hiệu quả trong cái việc quản lý các cái uh, chạm sạc điện mà chúng thành phố Hà Nội cũng có thể sẽ tham khảo ạ các anh chị có câu hỏi nào về uh, uh, nội dung của bài thuyết trình của ông Sergio không ạ so now we have the next speaker uh, Dr. Jian Hu Chen Dr. Yen Hochens is program officials of the Transportation Program Energies Foundation China. 
focusing on the electric vehicle and related field. Uh, before joining the foundation in November 2017, he worked for the China National Institute of Standard standardized for nine years in emission reduction and energy conservation standardized research. Uh, so uh, now we are welcome Dr. Trent with the presentation for on EV charging. Um, bây giờ chúng ta sẽ đến với phần trình bày của tiến sĩ Trent. Tiến sĩ Trent này có rất là nhiều năm kinh nghiệm trong cái lĩnh vực uh, phát triển hạ tầng chạm sạc ở Trung Quốc. So please welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your introduction. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, very, it's my uh, pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, uh, share some information about the uh, EV charging infrastructure development in China. And uh, I'm working for uh, Energy Foundation uh, China and introduced by the chair. And the next slide, please. Okay, uh, today I want to uh, share uh, many in three parts. Uh, the first one will be the EV charging infrastructure targets and the treatments in China. And uh, then I want to share something about the current policies, uh, which uh, promoted the, uh, the, the, the charging infrastructure installation and operation. And last, and uh, we could uh, uh, discuss some challenges and the opportunities now. Uh, ne next, slide, next slide, please. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, in China, uh, the electric vehicle uh, is called as the new energy vehicle, uh, short as NEVs. So maybe in the following slides, you could see some, uh, some words uh, like EV and NEVs. Uh, they are in the same meaning. Uh, uh, NEV uh, uh, is used mainly in uh, the official documents and the policies in China. And in this slide, uh, there are two figures. The right figure shows the NEV annual sales uh, to September of this year. And uh, you may found that the NEV sales surged this year and uh, the penetration rate has achieved almost uh, uh, 12%. Uh, compared to the uh, uh, up, um, about five percent last year, and uh, and in China the battery electric vehicle dominates the EV market uh, uh, with uh, an uh, eighty uh, percent share. The charging infrastructure grows with the EV market expanding in China. In the uh, left figure, the amount of the charging posts uh, also uh, showed a growing trend in the past. Uh, uh, five years, and uh, now every three uh, electric vehicles in China could be matched with one charging pole. Uh, and uh, uh, if we look at the public uh, charging pole only, uh, uh, every seven uh, uh, e electric vehicles matched with one pole. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and. Uh, uh, compared to the uh, 2020 targets uh, for charging infrastructure development in China, uh, the public charging poles exceeded the target uh, by about 60%, uh, uh, while uh, the other two kinds of uh, types of charging poles, uh, which are the private charging poles and the charging poles in working place, uh, still uh, lagged far behind the targets by 2020. Uh, the charging poles in working place achieved about 50% uh, of the target uh, number uh, and the private charging poles in the uh, residential communities only accomplished 30% uh, to 50% of the target. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, how to access the availability of charging poles uh, to serving the EV consumers. Eight is an important, interesting, but also a tough issue for us. Uh, in the official document in China, it used to set a ratio of uh, electric vehicles to charging poles in case of the electric vehicle charged when it parks. Uh, 
but it is found that it doesn't work in all kinds of cases. So uh, cited from uh, cited an example from one of uh, the uh, projects we supported, the ratio of charging stations to gas stations in uh, in the uh, cities uh, was uh, calculated, and uh, we could find that uh, this ratio in tier one cities has been more than one, uh, which means the electric vehicle drivers could find the public charging poles as conveniently as the gas station. Uh, and the, uh, the EV penetration rates uh, mainly uh, showed in the uh, right uh, two figures uh, in this slide uh, 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 for electric taxis and the electric uh, deliverable vehicles uh, respectively in these cities were also higher than those in other cities. Uh, we believe the public charging post construction is a synergistic process with the immediate deployment. Next slide, please. Uh, and, uh, and the charging poles serve different transport modes in different ways, as many uh, speakers today uh, showed before. And the private electric cars and the heavy duty electric trucks still lack satisfied charging solutions in China. Okay, next slide, please. And this slide, I uh, collected some uh, pictures uh, to show some cases for uh, different kinds of uh, uh, transport mode. Uh, for, for example, we could found on the upper right, uh, it's, uh, uh, sen uh, it's a centered uh, charging station restricted to the electric buses. And the uh, lower uh, left uh, is, is a, a battery sweeping station for the heavy duty tractor trailer. And the upper right, shows the battery sweeping station for the electric taxi and the ride hauling. And the uh, lower right uh, shows the community charging station for the electric bikes. Uh, uh, one more thing, the electric bikes is not included in the electric vehicle uh, categories in China. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I'd like to show some uh, 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 policies. Uh, these policies uh, promote the charging infrastructure installation operations in China. Next slide, please. Uh, first of all, oh, sorry. Yes, the national strategy and the targets guide the charging infrastructure development in China. It is very important uh, because uh, uh, these kind of uh, strategy and the targets uh, gave uh, a confidence to the market and the stakeholders. Uh, for instance, the targets for private charging poles and the working place charging poles are set in case of one uh, electric vehicles to one pole in China. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the first uh, uh, national strategy for charging infrastructure uh, was unveiled in 2015. Uh, and the targets to uh, 2020. Uh, after that, a new uh, policy has been prepared for the charging infrastructure development after 2020, uh, which aims to sustain the, uh, the electric vehicle development and the support achieving the goals in the uh, national electric vehicle plan toward 2065, uh, 2035, sorry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and under the uh, strategy and the targets, the priority was identified in terms of regions and the uh, charging scenarios in order to ease the beginning. Uh, for regions, uh, the Eastern Coast and provinces in China uh, were selected to accelerate the charging infrastructure development uh, because uh, these regions has better economy and uh, has higher air uh, quality expectation. So they have stronger motivation to deploy electric vehicles uh, uh, and uh, to uh, construct uh, the charging infrastructure. The 2020 targets uh, for uh, this kind of region have been achieved by 2020. 
uh, and uh, in the middle provinces of China, demonstrations were uh, encouraged to uh, construct charging poles and uh, uh, deploy electric vehicles. And the other underdeveloped provinces were the third tier region, um, and the latter two regions uh, couldn't, uh, sorry, haven't achieved their 2020 targets. And uh, uh, for the snare rails, the charging poles restricted to public service electric vehicles on the highest priorities uh, and the targets achieved. And although the charging poles in community and working places were also paid a lot of attention to, uh, but uh, the target hadn't been met uh, by 2020. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, you could find that the public charging poles, uh, I mean, the, for all kinds of electric vehicles also achieved its 2020 targets. And uh, next slide, please. All right, and uh, uh, there are also uh, there were also uh, fiscal and non-fiscal incentive measures uh, 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 to jointly support the installation and operation of the charging poles. Uh, for example, the uh, fiscal incentives uh, include the construction of welding uh, and uh, the uh, lower electricity rate in operation, and uh, also the uh, charging service fee determined by the public charging company, uh, which could encourage better charging performance and the, the uh, uh, better uh, station uh, side distribution. And the non-fiscal incentives uh, include uh, developing standards for interconnection, uh, smart or daily charging, high power charging, and the vehicle to grid. Uh, and also include the requirements for uh, uh, reserving the grid capacity and the electricity supply and parking lots, for example, to support 100% charging post installation demand in newly built residential communities. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, finally, I want to uh, raise about the local pilots. The local pilots supplement and inspired the national policies as well. Uh, for example, uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, mega cities in China, uh, for example, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and, uh, uh, and these uh, uh, pioneer electric vehicle pilot cities or provinces have been exploring the electric vehicle development pathways and shows the performance. Uh, uh, for example, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and uh, Hainan province have set the electric vehicle development targets at least 10 years earlier than the national ones. And uh, so uh, this kind of uh, uh, policies uh, also promoted the uh, charging infrastructure construction and operations in uh, these cities or provinces. And uh, this uh, pioneer uh, pilots uh, also uh, supply additional subsidies for the charging station construction and operation. Uh, and uh, another very important uh, driving force is from the air pollution control. The key area for air pollution control are required and uh, subsidized to deploy the electric vehicles and uh, to uh, construct the charging infrastructure. And now the Ministry of Information and, uh, uh, sorry, the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology of China uh, has uh, just issued a, a new pilot to promote the battery sweeping uh, uh, mode uh, uh, for, uh, for the electric vehicle development, especially for the heavy duty commercial vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, oh, next slide, please. Let's talk about some uh, the, the challenges. The, uh, uh, we think the first challenge is the is that the multiple decision makers and the stakeholders increase the complexity, uh, complexity for uh, alignment and action. Uh, you could see that there are uh, mainly uh, uh, seven ministries in China uh, uh, relating to the charging infrastructure uh, uh, management. Uh, 
uh, the, uh, the, the rainfall uh, are the, uh, uh, the most important uh, for uh, ministries. Uh, the National Development Reform and Commission and, and, and the National Energy Administration uh, is leading the development of the charging infrastructure plans. Uh, and uh, because the uh, uh, charging infrastructure uh, is related to the uh, land using as well as the uh, electricity distribution. Uh, so the uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development, uh, which uh, charge of the urban rural land management and as well as the building code uh, is also very important for the uh, charging infrastructure development in China. Uh, and uh, the Ministry of Transport uh, manage the parking in the uh, city area. So it is also very important for the charging infrastructure development. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, another challenge uh, is uh, the limited successful business mode for public charging service. Uh, most charging service companies are facing difficulty uh, making profits from public charging. Uh, uh, there are, uh, for, for example, according to a statistic result from uh, the uh, Charging Infrastructure Promotion Alliance of China, the time and utilization rates of public charging stations in China are all lower than 15% it is quite difficult for them to uh, make profits. Uh, there are um, several key reasons, including uh, the poor location due to no development plan or land availability and the high cost uh, 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 coming from the, uh, the, how to say the, the service fee, the parking fee and the electricity price uh, for the consumer uh, and uh, the slow charge charging for most early installed charging posts compared to the fast uh, charging demand nowadays. And, and, uh, uh, and the different charging standards and the low demand for public charging because most early EV owners figure out solutions to install charging posts at home or work. And their low range electrical vehicles are just for daily commute, uh, commuting. Uh, Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and as mentioned above, uh, because the urbanization in China is a pacing growing, um, there are old and modern communities distributing crossly in the urban area uh, of the uh, Chinese mega cities. So the charging posts are difficult to install in the older communities uh, like what the right photo shows as there are limited parking spots and, uh, uh, and the poor power distribution load. Uh, according to the uh, China uh, uh, Charging Infrastructure Promotion Alliance standard stake, about 30% of the private electric vehicle consumers didn't have their private charging poles. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So facing such challenges, what can we do? Uh, uh, we believe first one, we could develop charging infrastructure strategies and uh, plans that integrate the electric vehicle development with the technology innovation, urban planning and the grid development. It is very important. Uh, uh, and, the, and the second, we could conduct the local pilots to demonstrate uh, the successful charging infrastructure uh, uh, models uh, for replication. And the last, we need to promote the research and the deployment of innovation technologies, such as the high power charging, smart battery charging, as well as the uh, vehicle grid integration technologies. Okay, next slides. Okay, thank you for your attention and the uh, questions are welcome. Thank you, Dr. Chan, for your informative presentation.
the developments of uh, such infrastructure in China is really rapid. We are impressed with the statistics you include in your slide. China government have applied many effective strategies to promote the charging infrastructure's installation and operation. And it seems to me that we also saw the same challenges in development of charging infrastructure in Vietnam. So we can learn a lot from your experiences on this. Thank you for joining us. And now we are welcome the question from the audience. À, với à, phần trình bày của tiến sĩ Chen thì chúng ta đã có được một cái nhìn tổng quan về việc phát triển cơ sở hạ tầng chạm sạc tại Trung Quốc với tốc độ phát triển rất là nhanh chóng và chúng ta cũng thấy là ở Trung Quốc thì cái những cái thách thức và những cái cơ hội thì chúng ta cũng có uh, thể học hỏi được rất là nhiều từ những cái cơ hội và thách thức mà Trung Quốc đang gặp phải để có thể uh, áp dụng cho cái uh, cho việc phát triển chạm sạc hạ tầng chạm sạc ở Việt Nam ạ. Vậy các anh chị uh, có câu hỏi nào cho diễn giả thì chúng ta có thể để lên phần chat box để chúng ta uh, cùng trao đổi ạ. At the chat, I have one question from the audience. On the incentives uh, for years for the charging infrastructure installation, do you have any difficulties in applying the uh, finance incentive on the electricity price for the charging infrastructures in China? Uh, okay, thank you. It's a very good question. And the electricity price in China uh, is uh, different in case of the cities. Uh, yeah. for, for example, in Shanghai, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the relevant uh, 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 electricity price yeah. Uh, is different uh, uh, according to their uh, charging timing. Uh, but in Beijing, uh, all time, uh, the electricity price are same in all time. So uh, uh, they, they have, uh, so it lead to a different uh, charging, uh, uh, how to say, charging strategy for the uh, private consumers. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, another one is for the public uh, uh, charging stations in terms of the uh, uh, electricity price uh, uh, because the, uh, in order to encourage the uh, uh, charging post uh, construction, uh, the Chinese government uh, allowed it to uh, reduce the electricity price for the public charging stations. And it is a very uh, important uh, encourage or incentive uh, measures uh, for the public charging station owners. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, besides of that, additional uh, charging service fees could be uh, charged by the uh, charging operators. Uh, so uh, it also encourage or incentives uh, the uh, public charging uh, uh, post uh, construction. Uh, but, uh, 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 okay, I think this is the information I'd like to share with you. But the biggest uh, uh, difficulty for the public charging station uh, nowadays uh, is not the price of the electricity or the uh, charging service fee. Uh, it's uh, about the time utilization rate uh, uh, because uh, in the beginning stage, uh, many charging uh, uh, station owners uh, try to uh, uh, separate uh, as many as charging stations, uh, and uh, and because they believe uh, the EV uh, market will uh, expand uh, very uh, uh, quickly, uh, but uh, now uh, there has not been, there have not been so many electric vehicles or there has not enough electric vehicles to, uh, uh, how to say, to uh, use their uh, charging service. Uh, so uh, they could make profit uh, in, uh, how to say, in the, uh, at the beginning, maybe five years. Uh, so uh, this 
influence the uh, followers' uh, uh, confidence. Okay. No, oh, I see. Uh, we have one more question from the audience. Uh, can you uh, tell us how to develop and organize the charging station so that different kinds of electric car uh, can use them together in, in one charging station in China? Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are uh, several kinds of uh, uh, public charging stations in China. Yeah. Uh, the most uh, uh, popular one is the uh, how to say the, the public stations for all kinds of electric vehicles yeah. uh, because uh, China has uh, uh, standardized the, the charging uh, ways, uh, let me see, in uh, 2015. Uh, uh, so after that, uh, all the uh, electric vehicles produced in, uh, sorry, uh, sold in China and the charging stations constructed in China uh, uh, need to obey the same uh, standard. Uh, so all kinds of electric vehicles uh, could use uh, uh, how to say the standard uh, charging uh, poles uh, in the uh, public charging stations. Uh, 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 and uh, another kind of uh, public charging station, uh, I mean, uh, the it is the station restricted to one kind of uh, transport mode, for example, the public, uh, for, sorry, the charging station for the electric buses. Uh, sorry, the uh, charging station restricted to the uh, uh, electric buses uh, because the uh, the bus service uh, is a very important uh, way uh, to uh, to uh, convenient uh, convenient to the city uh, transport, uh, and uh, their charging station is restricted. Uh, I mean, not open to other kind of electrical vehicles, and uh, an, another and the similar uh, charging station uh, is also for the how to say the electric deliverable uh, vehicles. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, let me see. I'm not sure if I uh, if you satisfied what I answered. Uh, I think that. Uh... Maybe let me ask him. Uh, anh Đoàn đây, uh, bác uh, Trans có trả lời rằng uh, cái um, sau năm 2015 thì ở Trung Quốc người ta có tiêu chuẩn về các trạm sạc. Uh, thì các cái xe sản xuất sau đó thì đều sẽ sử dụng chung được cái trạm sạc uh, đó. Tuy nhiên thì có một số các, các loại xe đặc biệt, ví dụ như là xe buýt điện chẳng hạn thì cái trạm sạc sẽ uh, được uh, bố trí riêng bởi vì đây là cái xe phục vụ công cộng và vì vậy thì Uh, chỉ có những cái yếu tố riêng vậy thôi còn những như là các hãng xe ô tô chẳng hạn thì có thể cùng sử dụng một trạm sạc anh uh, có muốn hỏi thêm gì không ạ um, Van uh, yes uh, if I may uh, add uh, regarding the incentives uh, for electric vehicle users, uh, the, I can provide you some feedback from Madrid. Okay. Um, electric uh, vehicles have a reduced uh, tax, so they 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 don't pay the the local tax. Uh, yeah. They they are exempt, um, and also uh, they have a. Uh, they, they can park for free in the yeah. street so they don't need to even take a ticket for parking those two incentives are very attractive for electric vehicle users as well as having free access to the low emission zone so the, the area of the city center where there are some restrictions and they they can move freely so those three uh, incentives are helping a lot also for for the the, the uh, promotion of electric mobility Yes, thank you. Thank you for the saving of that. I will translate to the audience. Yeah, your recommendation. Uh, bác sĩ Sergio người có chia sẻ thêm là uh, với một số cái chính sách khuyến khích ví dụ như là không cần phải đóng thuế á, không cần là uh, không mất tiền đỗ xe hay là có thể uh, sử dụng cái uh, có thể đi vào cái 
khu vực low emission zones à, một cách thoải mái thì đây đều là những cái chính sách khuyến khích mà rất là hấp dẫn để à, những để mọi người có thể chuyển đổi từ các phương tiện là truyền thống sang phương tiện xe điện ạ. Thank you for that. Thank you for the recommendation. Dr. Chance, I think that uh, the audience is satisfied with your answers. He understands now with the standards, standardized uh, charging infrastructure, which all the all different kind of cars or two wheeler can use this at the same time. Yeah. Only uh, for electric spots, we have different uh, charging infrastructure, right? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chan, for joining us today. Now we move to the. Okay, we have one more questions for you <laughs> on the audience. So I think that we have we will spend some time for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, to the presentation. Uh, from the audience, uh, he want to add that. Uh, Uh, that China develop uh, its own charging station standards, or is it a general international standard that can be used in other countries? Excuse me. The you mean the the China the China's national standard? Yes. For for it, charging. It, yeah, it is the same with international standard, or used only for China. I, I don't think so. It is okay. not the uh, same one. Yeah, uh, with the international standards. Yeah. Yes. So uh, China had its own standard for uh, charging infrastructure, charging station, right? Yes. 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 It, it is uh, difference have many uh, difference from the international standards. Uh, uh I think the 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 biggest difference uh, is how to see. Is is the is the charging, uh, is the charger. Ah, the chargers. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, but uh, 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 but in other parts, I think uh, there are not so many differences. Yeah. Yes. But the charger uh, couldn't uh, use uh, with each other. Yeah. Okay. Uh, như ông vừa chia sẻ thì à, uh, thực ra thì Trung Quốc thì có tiêu chuẩn riêng ạ. Nhưng mà cái khác biệt lớn nhất ở đây chính là cái chính là cái đầu sạc ạ. Còn các cái yếu tố kỹ thuật ở bên trong thì không khác nhiều ạ. Dạ anh anh Đức có thêm câu hỏi gì không ạ? Yes, so uh, he say thank to your answers. Okay. So thank you Dr. Chen for sharing the presentation on China development in, in charging infrastructures. Uh, we also have some time to uh, set the question and answer with you and uh, Mr. Shek Yo. Now we have, actually we have the Q&A session. If any audience have more question for all the speaker, now we have Shek Yo, uh, Dr. Trance and Anh uh, Phạm Hoài Phương. Chúng ta sẽ đến phiên thảo luận ạ. Nếu các anh chị có câu hỏi gì thì chúng ta có thể nhanh chóng đặt ra để các diễn giả ở đây có thể trả lời. Hiện tại thì trong phiên của chúng ta đang có ba à, diễn giả vẫn còn đang online trực tiếp ạ. Đấy là à, tiến sĩ Chen, ông Sergio đến từ thành phố Madrid và à, anh Phạm Hoài, Phan Hoài Phương đến từ à, Viện Chiến lược Phát triển Giao thông ạ. Mr. Sekyos, may, may I uh, ask you one question about the sharing, the sharing uh, is vehicle system you apply in uh, your companies. You know, in, yes, in Hanoi, we are trying to conduct a demo on using electric to weather to connect uh, uh, the BRT station and a shopping mall. And we also 
find some difficulty in applying this. So maybe you can say some uh, some experience on the sharing is vehicle. Yes. Um, well, indeed, the the sharing service we provide is a, is by using electric bikes. Yeah. So it's like a bicycle with electric assistance for the pedaling. Pedaling. Uh, in Europe, we call them pedalex. Um, and uh, we have uh, around 3,000 and uh, we have 260, around 260 stations, bike stations. But the service has also some bikes which uh, are can be used in a free floating basis. So they have a battery and whenever you pedal, you get some electric assistance. It has three different uh, power levels. And they are very, um, very valued by, by users. Uh, it's also a way to promote in cycling, uh, though in the last uh, months we are uh, experiencing some problems, especially with the redistribution of the bikes and the maintenance of the bikes. But the idea is to enlarge the system and to reach all the city districts, um, and that will be done in the upcoming years. Um, it's a way of uh, promoting electric mobility like an, at an earlier stage, and also to remove some barriers. For instance, in, in Madrid, there are people that say that there are a lot of uh, hilly areas, or uh, it's very hot in summer, or, uh, and it's not pleasant to ride a bike. So this way, it's it's easier. Um, but it is true that it's uh, it, it also brings some concerns, especially with the redistribution and the maintenance of, of the system. On top of that, in Madrid, there are quite a lot of shared mobility services that use electric vehicles. As a matter of fact, Madrid is one of the cities in Europe with the highest number of private shared mobility operators, either vehicles, I mean cars. Uh, I think there are at the moment four different companies, uh, motor uh, mopeds or, or light electric motorbikes. There are also several ones and also some e-scooter uh, companies. And um, they initially work very well. Now there are some also problems regarding the use of public space and the, the um, how to say, the enforcement of the proper parking regulations because sometimes people leave the motorbikes on the pathways and that generates a lot of controversy with pedestrians. So the city is working on that. Okay. I think that in Vietnam, we also have the same problem with the space for the parkings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are also trying to find a solution for that. Okay, thank you for your sharing. Uh, em, uh, tôi xin có một cái câu hỏi cho diễn giả Phan Hoài Phương ạ. Uh, với cái bài trình bày của anh Phương thì thực sự là có uh, rất là nhiều những thông tin quan trọng liên quan đến cái khó khăn và cái vai trò của chính phủ trong việc tạo điều kiện và hỗ trợ uh, thiết lập các mạng lưới chạm sạc điện ạ. Uh, tuy nhiên thì uh, với các cái chính sách phát triển uh, xe điện hiện nay thì anh Phương có thể cho uh, một uh, số cái ý kiến đánh giá xem là uh, cái ở đất nước chúng ta ở Việt Nam chúng ta để cái việc uh, các cái chiến lược phát triển xe điện như vậy thì hiện nay cần có thêm những cái uh, gọi là những cái hoạt động bổ trợ gì từ các bên liên quan để có thể thực hiện uh, được các cái chiến lược này một cách hiệu quả uh, dạ anh uh, Phương ạ Vâng, thế à, xin phép chắc là anh Phương có chút việc thì chúng à, xin phép sẽ gửi câu hỏi à, đến anh Phương sau ạ. I think that uh, the audience will have uh, some more question in the near future and uh, um, we uh, will uh, send the question to your email to have further discussion. Is that okay? All right, no problem. Yes, thank you for that. Before closing the session today, we have a survey uh, which we uh, like the, all the speaker and audience can give feedback on the uh, trainings uh, course to have uh, the development, the improvement in the near futures. 
So please uh, spend some minutes on the survey as you can see on the screen. You can find the links to the survey on the chat box. You can uh, assess the link and give some feedback for it on the question on the survey. Thank you. À, à, xin phép các anh chị là trước khi chúng ta kết thúc khóa học thì chúng ta sẽ có một cái bài khảo sát ạ. Cái bản khảo sát này thì nhờ các anh chị dành khoảng vài phút để chúng ta hoàn thiện. Bản khảo sát này chính là những cái um, feedback đối với ban tổ chức để chúng tôi có thể tổ chức những cái khóa học uh, hiệu quả hơn và ngày càng tốt hơn ạ. Xin cảm ơn các anh chị ạ. Các anh chị có thể truy cập vào đường link trong phần chat của um, Zoom để chúng ta hoàn thiện cái phần uh, bản khảo sát này ạ. Sorry, I realize that we do not have the English version for the survey. So I will, uh, we will send the English version to the speaker, to the international speaker later. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, Mr. Sergio, actually you have one more question. Maybe we can send, spend one minute for that. Uh, from the audience, he would like to ask uh, how to, um, how to uh, set the low emission zone in Spain and uh, uh, what kind of fee the internal combustion engines vehicle need to uh, will be charged when uh, assess the low emission zone in uh, Spain in your okay. country yeah um well in Madrid uh, the low emission zone as, as such uh, started uh, quite a few years ago uh, firstly just to promote uh, let's say residential uh, use so so just limiting in certain uh, neighborhoods uh, the first low emission zone official one was set in 2016 when uh, 2017 sorry when uh, the air quality plan of the former city government was launched um, so it's basically the city uh, center of the city um, and uh, if you access with a vehicle which is not authorized, the fee is 90 euro. Uh, but then if you pay uh, within a certain uh, number of days, it's reduced by half, but uh, it's 90 euro. However, uh, now the new city government has uh, modified the low emission zone uh, to modify the, the restrictions. Um, it's based on the labeling of the vehicles the labeling is set at the national level so uh, depending on the technology of the vehicle and the year of the vehicle it has a different label and according to that label the most pollutant ones are those which are forbidden to get into the city center there are different exemptions such as if you are a resident if you have if you live within the low emission zone etc etc uh, but to support all these also the national government so at the spain level has also uh, developed a new regulation so by 2023 in two years time all the cities bigger than 50,000 inhabitants will have to uh, create a low emission zone and that will be mandatory yeah yeah thank you for that Uh, as may you uh, have finished the surveys, so I think now uh, the time we run out. So I would like to now that the training session, the Hanoi training session, will be end today. Before the end of the session, I would like to give my sincere thanks to all the speaker who joined us today and deliver many informative presentation uh, to Hanoi's uh, training. Uh, we also would like to say thank to uh, um, CIS Clean Air Asia in cooperation in organizing the training and all of college in participating and all the participants for the Chihano training. We have uh, a successful uh, training session and uh, we think that in the near future, we would like to see all of you again in the next training session of the project 
So thank you all for that and see you. Thank you. Bye yeah. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. À, xin phép được à, dừng à, à, cái à, khóa học ở đây ạ. À. Đây là buổi cuối của chúng ta và chúng ta đã học à, có được rất là nhiều những cái thông tin quan trọng tới từ cả à, trước khi mà dừng à, chương trình học thì xin phép được gửi lời à, cảm ơn đến các diễn giả đã tham gia khóa học à, tới à, tổ chức à, Clean Air Asia đã cùng phối hợp tổ chức khóa học này một cách rất là à, nhiệt tình. Còn xin gửi lời cảm ơn đến tất cả các, các thành viên tham dự thành viên trong tổ chức và cũng như là các anh chị học viên đã tham gia khóa học và đã đóng góp rất là nhiều uh, cho cái khóa học này uh, chúng ta sẽ xin phép được hẹn gặp lại nhau trong các cái khóa học tiếp theo và với nhiều nội dung bổ ích hơn ạ uh, xin cảm ơn ạ và xin hẹn gặp lại ạ